Right, it's uh, really my pleasure to be here and um, to be moderating this another exciting uh, panel discussion. Uh, I'm, I'm, I know I have a very tough task uh, this afternoon because after having lunch, everybody is getting sleepy. So it's my sort of my job to spice up thing, things up a bit. So, uh, well, since we are behind the schedule, so we'll try to keep our conversation quite brief and then open rooms for maybe some questions and answers afterwards. Uh, let me introduce uh, my uh, speakers. Uh, the first one um, is Chanti Dearam. Uh, she's the founder of International Women's Rights Action Watch, Asia Pacific, and a former CEDAW committee members. Uh, and then on my, also on my left, Kun Emily Palami Pradichit, uh, founder and executive director of Manusia Foundation. Then Professor Ku Ying Hui, uh, head of the Department of International and Strategic Studies, Faculty of Arts and Social Science, University of Malaya. And then on my left, my very good friend, Fuadi Pitsuwan, from, uh, he is the president of Surin Pitsuwan Foundation. So that's uh, a brief introduction. So let's talk to, let's go to the first speaker, uh, Madam Shanti. Uh, in, as we, as the, the, the focus of this panel discussion is freedom of worship and freedom of speech, uh, I would like to ask in your uh, experience, how do perceptions and interpretations of freedom of religion and belief vary across different culture and genders, and which rights have proven to be the most challenging to implement in practice? particularly for women, and why? Uh, dear friends, good afternoon. Uh, I shall start without much formalities. Um, in my presentation, uh, just to let you know, there's going to be a slant, number one, on some practical situations in Malaysia, where I come from, on the access of the right to freedom of religion um, and worship, there will be some gender perspectives in what I also present. And thirdly, the claim, I'm going to talk about some case law on the claiming of the right to freedom of worship, but uh, through international law processes. Basically, that's what I'll be touching on. Now, historically, freedom of religion or religious liberty is a principle that has been, is found in the UDHR, Article 18 and it has been used to refer to the tolerance of different theological systems of belief, while freedom of worship has been defined as freedom of individual action to pay homage to the, ideo to the belief and ideology of a religion and their faith is concerned. This right supports the freedoms of individuals or communities in public or private to manifest religion or belief or ideology in teaching, in practice, in worship and observance. The right in, this right includes freedom for a person to change their religion or belief or to choose not to practice a religion at all. Now in Malaysia, <clears throat> I'm sorry for in Southeast Asia, those who are affiliated to certain religions like Christianity do not enjoy the same freedom of religion as others, although their constitution may guarantee them this right. This happens in spite of, as I said, these constitutional guarantees. But this right is impinged upon or restricted in certain Southeast Asian countries because of monitoring and surveillance by the government on the activities of people belonging to certain religions like Christianity in particular. I'm just putting that before you and not elaborating on it. Now, in Malaysia, Article 11 of the Constitution provides the right to profess and practice any religion, although subject to applicable law, restricting the propagation of other religions to Muslims in Malaysia. Muslim as a multiracial, multi-religious country has its own dynamics where the right to religion is concerned. The law in Malaysia also prohibits Muslims from changing their religion. Freedom of religion gives Muslims the right to practice Islam, but not to change their belief. Um, so this, uh, yeah, Malaysia is also a multi-religious society prone to intergroup conflict. As such, 
care is taken in Malaysia not to publish articles that cast a slur on any religion in the country. So freedom of expression and speech is prohibited if it touches on any matters pertaining to religion. Although the purposes of restriction are for political stability and national security, scholars have observed that the ruling government has indeed manipulated religious expression, the freedom of, of the right to religious expression for political domination and regime security. So there is a political angle when it, these restrictions are imposed. As a result, in Malaysia, there are numerous laws that restrict freedom of speech or the freedom of expression or the freedom to propagate or publish views and opinions. I, uh, Watsala has distributed a report to all of you where this will be touched upon. There are many, many laws, and I'm in the interest of time, I am not going to list all the laws that are there. In, uh, uh, Otherwise, it'll take us a lot more time to look at it now. The next point I want to say is we need to apply international standards to ascertain the criteria by which restrictions can be legitimately imposed on the freedom of expression, on the freedom to propagate or publish views and opinions. Article 19 of the ICCPR, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, gives us such criteria. It says there that these restrictions must be provided by law and are seen as absolutely necessary for respect of the right or reputation of others. You cannot, your restriction of expression and speech can be limited for the protection of national security or of public order or of public health or morals. This morals in particular is rather for me vague of what is moral and what is not moral and you can be penalized if your speech or expression is seen to impinge on morality. Now, the reports of the Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Religion and Belief is also a good source of standards as are international human rights treaties. And the Special Rapporteur on the Right to Freedom of Religion has expressed concerns uh, on the landscape for the exercise and enjoyment of the right to freedom of religion. Uh, again, uh, she spoke this morning, and she spoke about this landscape. So I'm not going to go in. I had some things that I'm not going to go into it. But her views that she has expressed on the landscape for the freedom of the right to expression worldwide, globally, is very alarming, really. That there is uh, violence against people and, and individuals. Um, intolerance manifested through derogatory stereotyping, negative profiling, all of this is happening, which makes it very difficult to exercise and enjoy freedom in law and practice. Now, secondly, we need a human rights approach when we wish to uh, claim the right to freedom of religion, freedom of expression, etc. The human, why do we need a human rights approach? The human rights approach requires spelling out the scope and content of rights in specific contexts. It sets norms and standards, naming the rights holders, naming the duty holders, and identify duties and obligations of duty holders. The human rights approach also requires establishing enforcement and accountability through law, policy, institutional arrangements, demanding realization of rights and non-regression of rights. The methodology of human rights approach is therefore much more precise than mere programmatic approaches or plans of action as it goes beyond aspirations. And the human rights approach is of value not only at the national level, but also at the international level. So I just want to put that idea before us today. I want to now touch on women and the significance of the right to freedom of religion and expression where women are concerned. The significance of, for women, uh, it has particular significance for women because religious belief affects women disproportionately and in different ways. Her sex, her race, her religion, and class intersect sometimes to her disadvantage, and the application of the law subjugates and delegitimizes her rights sometimes. What we have to look for is the question of equality and for women, 
the significance of civil and political rights for women, such as autonomy, choice, and equality when they wish to exercise their right to the freedom of uh, religion. And this may be denied to women because they are women. Further, women do not have leadership, the right of leadership within their religion. So they are not in a position to interpret religious texts, preach, teach, or adju adjudicate when there is a violation of the right to freedom of religion or expression. And in certain political contexts, their right to dress according to their conscience and will is also denied to women. Now, some scenarios to consider where these violations uh, occur, and I'm referring to the context here again for women. In Malaysia, we have a plural legal system especially in the area of family law, and, and therefore there are human rights violations, which becomes very complex because of the plural legal system. Uh, what is the issue here? If you are governed by laws based on your religion, or in some jurisdictions, ethnic identity, and at the same time, like in Malaysia, family law has Islam, Islamic family law, and you have the civil law for non-Muslims. So there are two systems side by side. In some jurisdictions, there may be ethnic identity or other legal systems, customary law, etc. Operating under such circumstances. What is the complication here? Michael Kirby, an Australian jurist, points out that the situation becomes ambiguous when there are two legal systems side by side. For example, he says, what has to be done where a person desires to escape their classification of the religion they have been put into. What has to be done where a person in one category wishes to marry a person in another category? In Malaysia, if you wish a non-Muslim wishes to marry a Muslim, they have to convert compulsorily. What has to be done to the classification of the children in such unions? What has to be done when a member of an indigenous community asserts rights under the general civil law different from those that would prevail under customary law, for example? Or could they? Could they manifest rights under the general law? Or what happens when there is conflict of laws and jurisdiction, as there is again in Malaysia? So where there is a diversity of law, it is necessary to provide for the interface of different legal systems. Malaysia has not provided for this, and therefore there are complications. In this case, in this regard, I wish to cite for Malaysia the case of a woman called Indra Gandhi. This is a complex case involving conflict of civil law and Islamic law jurisdiction, brought about by the conversion of the Hindu husband to Islam. They were Hindus. He converted, the man converted, and subsequently unilaterally converted the children from the first marriage, the Hindu marriage, to Islam sanctioned under the Islamic law jurisdiction. Further complications ensued as a result of the husband forcibly taking away the youngest child who was 11 months old from the mother and disappearing. And over long 14 years, in spite of the mother going in and out of the civil courts seeking justice, and in the civil courts she is given guardianship of her children, Indra Gandhi's quest to be reunited with her youngest child has till today not been successful. This is in spite of Indira Gandhi having equal guardianship under the civil law and has the right to have an equal say in the religion of her children. But the Sharia courts granted the husband the right to convert the children against the right of the mother under the civil law. So the high courts are saying something, the Islamic courts are saying something else. Freedom of religion here is also the freedom for both parents to decide on the religion of their children on the basis of equality. In Indira Gandhi's case, this does not have, did not happen in Malaysia. Now, the CEDAW committee has taken note of this and pointed to the violations of women's rights because of conversion to Islam from Hinduism by the male. The committee recommended that the state party undertake a process of law reform to remove the inconsistencies between civil law and Sharia law, including by ensuring that any conflict of law between civil law and Islamic law, family law jurisdictions 
with regard to women's rights to equal, be, be decided with regard to women's right to equality and non-discrimination and is resolved with full compliance with the Constitution and the Convention. This has not happened. The state has taken no such action to resolve the conflict of jurisdictions between the civil and the Sharia system since it was raised by the CEDAW Committee in the year 2006. We need a clear sense of the purpose of the law. We need judges who will be fair and rule according to the point of law and the spirit of the law, eschewing personal inclinations because of their cultural or religious inclinations. We need law enforcers who abide by the rule of law faithfully and execute the decisions of the court. This has not been happening in Malaysia. Now I wish to go give you some case law, and that will be my last point, case law regarding European court, uh, far away. I wish to speak a little about the European context and the banning of the veil worn by Muslim women who may be wearing the veil as an obligation under their religion and as a mark of their compliance to religious obligation and worship. The burqa ban facially it seems neutral, but in reality it is not so. Although the, bond, the legislative history and political context of the law suggests they were conceived precisely to address the Islamic dress, Islamic challenges to the legislation have been brought before national courts and regional tribunals, including the European Court of Human Rights under Article 9 of the European uh, Statute, uh, freedom of, which, is, which talks about freedom of religion, but I cite the case of Turkey, Sahin versus Turkey, where she took her case, she wanted to wear the veil but was not allowed to, she lost her job uh, in a public institution. Um, she was a young Muslim woman and who claimed the right to wear the headscarf. But the university had issued a regulation that prohibited students from covering their heads or sporting beards. After she declined to take off her headscarf, she was refused access to classes and examination. She exhausted domestic remedies and took her case to the European Court of Human Rights, where the Grand Chamber found no violation of her right to religious freedom. In legal terms, no violation of Article 9 was found. In light of the circumstances of the case and according to the standards test, the court held that the measure was subscribed by law. Uh, Turkey had domestic law to this extent that to this effect that she cannot wear the veil, that it had a legitimate aim because it was necessary in a democratic society and upheld the principle of secularism and equality, and that it was proportionate to the aim it sought. So they said she had no claim under the European, in the European court. Sahin questioned Turkey's status in light of this consideration that its judicial and university systems had been established by successive coup d'etats. She argued that a wide margin of appreciation should not be granted in this case to regulate the university student's dress. She argued that students were competent, discerning adults who could be able to make this type of choice. Her decision to wear the veil had been raised based on religious conviction and not in terms of opposition to state structures, values, or policies. In reading the court judgment, one gains the sense that the veil is not only an outward manifestation of religious belief, but also the front line of an encroaching Islamic trend that has to be rejected in the interests of gender equality and secularism. The state is supposed to have had the principle and policy of secularism. And so wearing the veil opposed the state's political agenda. And that's why she lost her case. This gave a political slant to her action to wear the veil. It's a symbolic rise of his, um, the state felt that her wearing the veil was, a, was symbolic of a rise of Islamist or political Islam, which the Tur Turkish government and the European court hopes to keep at bay. The issue is therefore, the issue is there is a political ideology that is at the heart of the matter, not religious freedom, right to religious freedom, and the courts were complicit in this. I have an interesting statement on this case. 
When the author appealed against her dismissal from state service, and she based her claims on all the, the grounds, because uh, there was another case, none, and she raised grounds of um, right to develop one's physical and spiritual being and national and national and international principle of law will all be violated if the author were to be punished for wearing the veil. She was rejected. And uh, the European court said the state had national priorities that went against her wearing the veil. So the, a scholar commented, here was international law taking on the principle of a national priority. And was international law superior in its decisions or not? Uh, so this, this is, uh, is part, part of the problem. And, and I just want to very briefly mention a Sidon Committee's case, where, again, a Turkey, Turkish woman was dismissed from her job because she wore a veil, and she brought a case under the optional protocol to CEDAW, saying that her right to employment, to income, to development, and she gave several cases, several uh, grounds was being impinged upon. Uh, unfortunately, um, she didn't use the terms, disc she was discriminated on the basis of sex. She didn't use that ground. She used grounds of her own personal development, income, job, development, and so on. And the CEDAW committee said that her argument had no validity because they were a committee looking at discrimination against women on the basis of sex. She never used that terminology. So they dismissed uh, uh, her case. So I want to can, conclude can here. Yeah. I'm just concluding, okay. last sentence. Rights are guaranteed in the Constitution, but they will not be conferred automatically on the individuals and people. The guarantees of the Constitution have to be interpreted, adjudicated, and enforced under existing national systems, institutions, and the law. We need a political analysis of what has gone wrong when rights are denied. We need an understanding of whose rights are denied and why, and whether we can identify any underpinning of discrimination against certain groups, and whether the claiming of such rights is in conflict with the political agenda of the state, or whether it is in opposition to the perceived mandate of an institution, uh, and therefore that institution is not going to grant your right, like the CEDAW committee. It said its mandate is discrimination on the basis of sex. And therefore, because this woman did not use that ground, uh, they did not grant the, the verdict in her favor. So if your claim is in opposition to the perceived mandate of the institution that you're going to, to grant you your right, you may fail. So you have to be very political when you're claiming your rights and see on what grounds you will really win. I'm sorry, I usually have a lot to say and I'm constrained uh, <laughs> by time limits, but I'm the end here. Thank you. Thank you so much for your uh, observations, uh, especially on the freedom. an observation on freedom of uh, religion, which is to practice but not to change, and to talk about the influence of government, uh, government manipulation and political ideology, and also touch upon the gender perspective, uh, especially how women were disproportionately affected by, by the, <clears throat> the policies. So with that, uh, I, let's move on to the next speaker, uh, Kun Emily, uh, from the uh, Manusia Foundation, I would like to, also, uh, to ask you uh, what are the primary factors behind these challenges and can you share the examples of these challenges and how they were addressed? Thank you. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Emily Palami Praditit. I'm the founder and executive director of the Manushaya Foundation. For those who don't know me, I'm an international human rights lawyer. 
I am Lao and I am French. I was born Lao political refugee and I founded Manushea in 2017 as a feminist human rights organization. So we work mainly with marginalized communities seeking justice for them before the United Nations so they can seek justice and we work at the intersection of climate justice, digital rights and protection of human rights defenders. So I'm very glad to be with you today as we celebrate the 75th year anniversary of the UDHR and I think we need to be very honest that there's little to celebrate uh, when we're talking about the 75th year of the UDHR. Um, author authoritarianism, oppression, uh, multiple inequalities and serious human rights violation are flourishing across the world today and in particular in the ASEAN region. Our democracies are under attack in Southeast Asia. According to Freedom of the World report by Freedom House, among 10 ASEAN countries, six are considered to be authoritarian regimes and only four are considered to be semi-authoritarian. Among them, you have four countries that are considered not free when it comes to online freedom of expression, as per the Freedom of the Net report. At Manushaya, we authored the Freedom of the Net report for Thailand and Laos, so I invite you to check our website if you want to know more how we have ranked Thailand as not free. I think I don't need to say more when it comes to Les Majesty and the Computer Crime Act and all the laws that have been weaponized to crack down on dissenting voices. So as we are celebrating the 75th anniversary of the UDHR, we need to talk about the international system. And the international system that has been birthed by the UDHR and the covenants and the treaties that have followed has failed us. In the face of capitalist greed, genocides, and earth extinction, powerful states have prioritized the self-interest, and most of the time, the even narrowed interest of the political and economic elites, abandoning the wider international human, right, human rights law obligation. That system has been restricting and excluding participation of those whose rights are at stake. And in particular, when we're talking about those whose rights are at stake, we're talking about those who are put at the margins of society. Most of the time, religious minorities, ethnic minorities, and indigenous people. So as we are gathering here today, we must recognize the importance of two fundamental rights, right? The freedom of worship and freedom of speech. These two freedoms are at the center of the most horrendous human rights violation in the world nowadays. Today, I want to focus our attention on these rights in the context of genocides that we are seeing unfolding on our screens in the Middle East and in the ASEAN region with particular emphasis on the, on the devastating situation faced by Muslims, mainly the Palestinian people and the Rohingya Muslim minorities. So in the world, I think it was obvious also uh, with what uh, uh, Shanti was saying earlier, there's an obsession against Muslim people and against Muslim women. There's a growing oppression and dehumanization of this Muslim population. They are treated as terrorists rather than human beings. So let's first talk about Palestine. In the midst of our celebration of the 75th of the year anniversary, we, need, we must recognize that the UDHR was created in 1948, the same year that the State of Israel was created, the same year when the Palestinian has lost the international human rights law and human rights story. So I think there's a dissonance, you know, when we're here today celebrating the UDHR and where we're talking about freedom of religion and freedom of speech because the same year that the declaration was, was created, it's supposed to be universal. But can we say that the declaration is universal for everyone and everywhere, when we see that the very same year marked the year when the Palestinian people lost their human rights? So it's really important for us to reflect on that. Um, as we speak, we are seeing the genocide unfolding under our eyes, on our screens, and we see the world not being able to do anything about it. And it's, it's mainly because of how the international system is being built, how countries have the right to put vetoes, how UN General Assembly resolutions that are passed at the majority are not being respected by powerful states, by states who are coming from the global minority, by states who are obsessed against the Muslim population in the world. And so as we speak about the, the, the UDHR and Article 18, which is related to freedom of expression, we also realize that Article 3, which is related to the right to life, is not being respected because Muslim minorities are being targeted and are being killed under our eyes. 
Now when we are zooming in into the ASEAN region, a similar genocide has been happening under our eyes and it has been targeting the Rohingya population. We have seen hate speech being used against the Rohingya minority on Facebook, on Twitter, on our social media platforms. We have seen hate speech. So the freedom of speech of some particular groups have been weaponized to target the Rohingya minority. That has resulted in a genocide in Myanmar. And as of today, nobody is being held into account. There is, a, there is an important fundamental right, freedom of speech, that is being uh, enshrined in the UDHR, Article 19, that we must all enjoy. But what is its limitation when that same right is being weaponized by a majority, a religious majority against a religious minority, and its results in hate speech and in genocide? So when we talk about hate speech, we also need to talk about tech responsibilities. Because tech companies have a huge responsibilities when it comes to respecting our freedom of religion, but also our freedom of speech. In, the, in these instances that we have witnessed, there is a crucial paradox, right? We are seeing rights, we are seeing freedom of worship, a beacon of hope for those seeking solace in their beliefs. But we see that this right is being stifled under the weight of oppression. And at the same time, we are seeing freedom of speech a cornerstone of democratic, for democratic societies, but is being twisted as a, as a weapon of hate, tearing communities apart. So as we celebrate the progress made over the 75th year of the UDHR, we must also confront the uncomfortable truth that our work is far from being done. Tech companies play a critical role in enabling hate speech. So why is their content boosted to promote hate speech against Muslim population? And why is their content being removed when those who are suffering are telling the truth? Our international human rights system cannot yet hold corporations into account. But it's been 75 years that the DHR has been created. As we are speaking about the binding treaty on business and human rights in Geneva, we have entered the ninth year of the negotiation. Yet, we still don't have a binding treaty on business and human rights because corporations are playing a critical role in pushing back on the binding treaty. The only uh, norms that we have are the UN guiding principles on business and human rights. These are voluntary measures that are not enough. So we really need to think of our international system and how our international system can actually effectively protect the freedom of religion and the freedom of speech to those who are, the, who are the most marginalized in our current days. And I'm talking about the Palestinian people and the Rohingya people. So it's clear that world leaders have failed us, and it's clear that the international system has failed us. But we must take up the universal declaration ambition as our own. We need to advance human rights, not only through a conversation among states, but through the mobilization of people worldwide in active solidarity. And so in the face of capitalist greed, of genocide, of earth extension, we must choose to unite around love, solidarity, and hope. I think it's really important for us, and most of us here are human rights lawyers, it's really important for us to stand together and to stand in solidarity. And we cannot be constrained by the international system that has its own limitation. 75th year of the UDHR, it's our time for us now to take back our power and to not just depend on states that are putting their own interests first and are all putting the interests of the political and economic elites first. It's important that we as people, communities and movements must reimagine our vision and renew our commitment to the realization of human dignity because none of us are, are liberated until all of us are liberated. And I want to quote uh, Audre Lorde, who is a feminist that I'm a fan of. She said that without communities, there's no liberation. So without all of us, there won't be liberation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Akuna and Emily, for your intervention on uh, the freedom of speech and, uh, and, and religions. Uh, yes, you talked about mainly on the on, on principle level, how it is so much needed for the democratic society and with uh, pressing issues as, as examples, genocide in, and uh, the issues affecting Palestinian people. And also on the responsibility level, where you know the, actually there are like a, in, in practical uh, contribution of the tech company on business, uh, 
playing, playing a huge role in promoting in, incitement and hate speech and how we should deal with that, including proposing the, the Business and Human Rights Treaty. So thank you very much for your observation. Next, we move to the academic aspect of uh, we have Professor Ku Yinghui from University of Malaya here. And uh, for you, I would like to ask, in your view, what are the key uh, challenges in teaching and promoting these freedoms in an, an academic setting? Hi, good afternoon, everybody. So uh, based on that questions, I'll be tackling this topic under this panel session too, freedom of worship and the um, freedom of speech. Uh, that to link it with the uh, educational lens. So what's very interesting is that uh, while we talk about freedom of worship and the um, freedom of speech, um, the missing link here uh, on the what are the intersectionality between the two freedoms and how it can actually impact in shaping our human rights education in the Southeast Asia. So today, but I will later on focus on the case of Malaysia, which is quite a unique one, whereby uh, looking at our educational um, framework. So when we talk about freedom of uh, worship here, um, why is uh, freedom of worship important in shaping the human rights education? Um, embracing the freedom of uh, worship is not only about honors our intrinsic uh, rights, but also it lays the groundwork actually for an inclusive human rights education to be put in place that can actually cherish us uh, different uh, perspective when it comes to uh, human rights. And equally important is the, uh, human, uh, the freedom of expression in shaping the human rights education as well. Because without the freedom of expression, it will be difficult uh, and challenging to empower individuals to be able to engage critically to questions and to learn to foster an environment that are friendly uh, for a comprehensive human rights education. So based on that ground, I would like to explore uh, the nexus between these freedoms and the human rights education, which is not merely theoretical, but actually is pragmatic and deeply embedded in our daily lives. So when individuals can actually uh, worship freely without fear and voices are allowed to actually express themselves without repressions, then we can actually uh, uh, nurture the seeds of uh, understanding whereby in turn, path the way for education that can actually transcend the boundaries, fostering respect, empathy and a commitment to upholding the right for all. The next sessions, I would like to uh, explore the intersections of uh, human rights and religion in the Southeast Asia. So when we look at the context in uh, Southeast Asia, the relationship between human rights and religion is very complex and has been a subject of uh, much debate. So Southeast Asia is a region that characterized by religion, uh, religious pluralism, when uh, with the majorities of the populations, if you look at the different 11 countries, most of the countries actually have one dominant religion. But at the same time, we have different others' religion as well. But the issue really arises, how does all this impact on our educations? And, uh, and uh, to make it even more challenging, in some countries, they actually integrate uh, the religious education into the formal curriculum that can actually further on impact on the freedom of worship as well as the freedom of expression um, itself. So there are two distinct uh, positions here when we talk about uh, this. One uh, is the secularist, whereby they advocate for strictly secular understanding of um, human rights, which uh, sometimes and often exclude or marginalize religious contribution to the discourse. So this is always a challenge that we face. Uh, in our academic settings and also the uh, even at the advocacy for the civil societies as well. And the second position is a pluralist, whereby pluralists believe that the value of various cultural, religious, and philosophical perspectives should be recognized in enriching human rights education and discourse. So within all these uh, different uh, understandings here, what we cannot dismiss is that while we talk about the concept of human uh, universal uh, rights that has developed, it is also to import. It is also important to note that the different philosophical views uh, that can become the starting points within this broad uh, framework that emphasise uh, not only the universal rights but at the same time the religious conceptions as well. But how do we? 
uh, draw the balance is the challenge that's that uh, we face. So the misalignment uh, between local realities, such as religious beliefs, cultural traditions, and everyday practices, and the concept of human rights as defined in the international instrument, like the UDHR, is often being criticized by uh, there is a clash between the local culture and the university uh, universal standards. So these complex situations, as I earlier mentioned, is complicated by religious curriculum in some of the countries when it is being institutionalized and uh, formalized as well. So in the Southeast Asia, if we look at the uh, how do we merge the nexus of the two overarching approaches to religious education, the first approach, the monocultural approach, where they emphasize uh, social cohesion by promoting the values and traditions of the majority uh, religion or the dominant uh, religion as the basic of uh, cultural recognition as the um, equal members of society. Conversely, the other approach, which is a critical multicultural approach, emphasizes the social diversity, fostering the intercultural understanding and the knowledge of religious diversity. So these approaches, this approach actually advocates for a more democratic citizenship based on the human rights norms and often aligned with the more global citizenship ideal that we talk about. In the context of Southeast Asia, very interestingly, however, it's still uh, very limited literatures and discussions to talk about how religion has played a significant role in shaping the human rights education. So religious instruction, for example, that is mandatory in some countries, can actually consume educational resources that we face, and it can potentially limiting the time and focus available for human rights education, and it was being used as a tool to say we have sufficient um, education that related to human rights principles. So uh, with that itself, I would like to move on to the case of uh, Malaysia. So in Malaysia, uh, what's very interesting is that uh, we have um, the three different educations here that talk about, or uh, for some uh, policy makers, that they mention there is some elements of human rights, but it is highly debated. Islamic education, moral education, and the civic education. So in the context of Malaysia, religious education is made compulsory and from in our formal uh, curriculum. And it is for the Muslims. But for the non-Muslim, we will have to take the moral education uh, entirely. And the civic education was actually introduced quite early after our Independence Day, but it faced quite a bit of a fluctuation whereby uh, there are policymakers that questions about the feasibility of such uh, um, educations in our countries. So Malaysia faced the challenge in terms of it is a multiracial country. Yeah? With these formats of religious education for only Muslims, the um, non-Muslim to take the moral educations, and the civic educations are somehow being used. For me, um, in my uh, own observations and from the data, it shows that it is used as a tool to cover back that we need to have a more comprehensive human rights education to be put in place in our countries. So, if we look deeply into uh, Malaysia, um, looking at the context of our education system, there are some literatures that actually criticize how moral education is being implemented in the schools because there are strong influence in terms of Islamic education settings that put forward into the moral education itself. And uh, moral education is as broad as uh, whoever has taken uh, moral education in uh, Malaysia will have these common uh, um, uh, um, comments that, you know, we are studying values, but we are not sure whose values that we are actually uh, learning, which can be very much uh, debatable. So uh, with that, I would like to move to the um, last part of my presentation that is on the um, challenges of the human rights and religion in Southeast Asia after looking at the case of uh, Malaysia itself. There are three challenges that I summar summarize here. First challenge is the religious pluralism versus the dominant religions in the Southeast Asia. So when we talk about Southeast Asia religious diversity, it presents a challenge when we try to harmonize between the human rights and religions. There's always a debate to say that 
how religion is compatible uh, with human rights, and it continues uh, until um, today. And this dynamics leads to the question about how to balance the rights and beliefs of the majority with the rights of religious minorities as well, that potentially causing the tensions between human rights values and the religious uh, traditions. And the second challenge here is the misalignment of local realities and universal um, standards. And uh, this misalignment itself poses a significant challenge uh, when it comes to the clash between the local cultural and religious norms and the universal human rights values that uh, lead to the difficulties in reconciling um, the two. And the third challenge will be uh, something that can be controversial and sensitive in some of the countries, that is uh, whether we should or how do we then integrate in terms of religious educations in our countries in the whole, uh, all the 11 Southeast Asian uh, countries. The integration of religious education within national curriculum can be a double-edged sword. Yeah? So while it allows for the teaching of religious values, it can potentially uh, limit the focus available for human rights education, as I earlier mentioned. So the challenge really lies in ensuring that religious education complements rather than hinders the promotion of human rights uh, in the Southeast Asia. So striking a balance between the cultural uh, heritage and the diverse worldviews in the educational system is a critical challenge that I think Southeast Asian countries face in promoting of human rights education. And I would like to conclude here by saying the nexus between democracy, human rights, and education forms the cornerstones of the Southeast Asia social political uh, landscape. While yes, in the earlier uh, sessions we have discussed about the concept of hum uh, the concept of democracy that can be very controversial. Nevertheless, in the academic settings, I think what we really need is the educa um, democrat democratic educational structures to be in place in order for you to actually uh, have the intersections of uh, freedom of religion and belief the uh, freedom of expressions in shaping the a better and a comprehensive human rights education in the Southeast Asia. With that, I'll thank uh, and uh, I'll end here. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much, um, <clears throat> Professor Ko Ying Hoi, for your observation on, on, on from the academic aspect. Of course, we, I would like to hi also highlight that we need an in inclusive human rights education in a, in a democratic society for, for us to move forward. Um, well, very quickly, our last speaker, I, I, I noticed myself that I'm being quite rushed, but yeah, I know, <laughs> because of the schedule. Um, my last speaker, uh, Fuadi Pitsawan, uh, the president of Surin Pitsawan Foundation. Uh, very quickly, uh, how, from a policy perspective, uh, the freedom of worship and speech, uh, how do, from a policymaker's, uh, from a think tank's perspective, how you contribute uh, to, uh, to shaping the public discourse and policy on these uh, activity and these issues? Uh, thank you, Ajahn Pawan uh, uh, it's a great honor uh, for me to be here, uh, being on stage and actually being listened to by, by people who I look up to, Ajahn uh, Sipapa, uh, Dr. Vithit, Tan uh, Kasit, former foreign minister of Thailand, uh, Mr. Domingo from the Philippines. Uh, it's, it's a really great honor actually to be not in the listening seat, but to be on the stage uh, speaking to, to you all uh, from different countries. Uh, as well. Uh, the two topics that I'm assigned to, to talk about, uh, freedom of uh, speech, expression, and freedom of religion and belief. Uh, I start with addressing the, the freedom of speech and expression, and then uh, go on to talk a little bit about religion and belief. Uh, my discussion will be largely uh, based on, on my experiences uh, in Thailand and, and my role in, in different uh, hats that, that I wear, I draw from, from those experience. On freedom of expression and speech, I, I, if you're not from Thailand, you may miss this, but if you have been following what the Thai government have been trying to portray in the international arena at the UN level, they're trying to say that you know, Thailand is back in business. Thailand is open for business. Thailand will respect human rights. 
uh, Thailand will be uh, in favor of, of, of freedom of speech, of human rights. But at the same time, there is a big contrast between what uh, the Thai government has been projecting internationally, trying to plant the flag internationally, and what happened in the country. Uh, right at the moment when uh, Prime, Minister, Prime Minister Seta was speaking at uh, UNGA, uh, talking about democracy and human rights, at that time, uh, on almost the same day, uh, one of the former Future Forward uh, MPs uh, was banned from politics uh, for life uh, based on a post she did uh, during college. And one of the activists here, uh, a few days later after that speech, is denied uh, bail uh, despite uh, being a recent uh, father. And you know, since July 2020s, uh, there have been uh, 1,253 uh, cases, right? And then, of these, among these numbers, 216 cases uh, involve uh, children under 18. And this is this is a big contrast that that I hope uh, you notice, and I think it is a big problem, and. And the government has been trying to push very hard to, to promote soft power, to promote Thailand as an investment, investment destination. But this contrast, this lack of consistency between the image that they are trying to paint at the international arena and what happened in the country uh, will be a detractor, will subtract from their effort to, to, pr to promote Thailand to promote Thailand soft power. So that's point number one that I, I hope uh, you notice. Uh, second, uh, we talk about Thailand, Thai, Thai state repressing people within its border. There is also, you know, I think going forward, uh, Emily has been involved in this as well. There's also cases of trans, what we call transnational repression of uh, individual uh, who have expressed their political views but being persecuted in another country based on the cooperation between two states. Uh, within the, the Beirut regime for the past uh, 10 years, there have been at least uh, 20 uh, cases on this. Uh, recently uh, in Malaysia, Mung uh, Tusa, a Rohingya, a Muslim uh, Myanmar activist, uh, have been persecuted and uh, her whereabout is unclear. It happened in Malaysia, but she is Myanmar. In Thailand, you may have remember issue of Khun Wan Shalom, who have disappeared from Cambodia. And there have been various Myanmar citizens who, who disappear from, from Mesot. And a Vietnamese uh, dissident uh, disappearing from, from Batum Thani. So cases like this, I think for the next you know, uh, several years, you, you will see movement within the, the human rights field uh, trying to focus on this and raise awareness uh, on this issue. So we talk about state repressing its own citizen within the border, state repressing its citizen in another country. Next, uh, what I'm worried about is actually really important and we, have, we tend to miss this, is the non-state perpetrators, which mean the people themselves are uh, doing these things to, to each other. Uh, I am really worried about this identity-dominated uh, action that, that has caused us to move away of, of what it means uh, to be uh, human. The act of dosing uh, online, dosing is when you dig up uh, personal information, private information of other people to post it on, on social media as a way to, to attack, to, to to, to, to hurt uh, other individuals, uh, even though not physically, but, but online. Uh, issue of harassment uh, based on different identities, you know, of, of political uh, uh, spectrum. Uh, it, this does not limit to, uh, you know, it's not, it, it, we have gone beyond state-led persecution or even majority-led persecution, but among uh, my th minorities uh, themselves, the, the ferventness, the, the, the passion sometimes really overtake uh, our ability to, to think that you know, we are all, at the end of the day, uh, are humans. So those are what, are, what I have to say about uh, expression and, and, and speech. On religion and belief, uh, admittedly, 
I think Thailand has done okay at the state level. I also speak on the stage here as a Muslim minority. I'm a Malay Muslim, come from southern Thailand, but but grew up in Bangkok, living in a Buddhist society, went to a Catholic school. I and I live in Chiang Mai. Uh, I I am okay as a Muslim. That's how I feel uh, growing up here, but. I think it's changing. If if you, you notice my name, when my late father uh, named my my name, uh, it's an Arabic name. Uh, means it's, he. I think he took it from the Egyptian national anthem. It means my heart. But if you notice, when when my late father named me in 1985, he used an Arabic name because he felt that our society, our country, is already okay to accept me as as who I am, right? My late father generation, he had, when he entered politics, he had to change his, la his name from, from Abdul Halim to Surin in order to fit into the society. But I think my dad may be mistaken. You know? uh, I think the past few years has been, we have seen a lot of incident and, and uh, a backsliding of how open Thailand is. There are, only, the, only last week, someone told me if I want to enter politics, I should consider changing my name. <laughs> so, so it, it, the the I'm I'm less worried about my my point. I'm less worried about state level action on this, but more of how the perception, the subconscious uh, prejudice uh, among uh, people who have a certain religion against other religions. Right, the issue of for Thailand, the issue of Hamas and Israel is extremely extremely sensitive. Uh, Sometimes when I go on TV commenting on this issue. The online comments in the comment section will be, why do we listen to him? He is Muslim. Uh, these are from Buddhist uh, commentators. Uh, and the, the Muslim identification with this issue doesn't help, right? I mean, where um, a lot of Muslims identify with this very strongly to the point that they can't separate between what Hamas this did could also be condemned. But that doesn't mean that you cannot identify with Palestinian rights. And I think that is really important. You know, I'm talking to also to among my, my Muslim friend minority that it is really important to separate between this, uh, these issues. It is possible that people of our identity, people who share our belief, may commit a crime or do something that is so gruesome that we also, as a minority, uh, would have to speak up. So I really hope that we, can, we have the ability to move away from this identity-led towards uh, saying things and doing things on, on, on what is right. And on this, from the policy perspective, the, the negotiation process of the Thai government uh, with Hamas, with uh, the Iranians, with the Turkish, with the Egyptians, what, what I have been trying to do, I, I told the Thai government that they should let Muslims have a role in this, this, this negotiation process. And I think if you see, if you saw Kun Wan Noor, who is the House Speaker, who is a Muslim, you saw him playing a role. And this, I told the government that if they give a role to, to, to the Muslim, it helps us contribute meaningfully to, to, to the Buddhist majority, to the Thai state. And that will allow Thai Muslims to live more uh, peacefully and feel more protected and less backlash against us because the Thai hostages are being uh, under Hamas control uh, right now. So we talk about persecution, prejudice against the majority, against the minority uh, in Thailand. The last issue I want to talk about is issue about minority doing it to minority themselves. Those who have been persecuted, the Muslim in Thailand who have been persecuted, end up persecuting, end up holding strong prejudice against the minority of the minor, minor, minority. And, and a case in point here that, that um, I will talk about is the LGBTQ issue within the Muslim community uh, in Thailand. Uh, it, I think people, uh, the, the, the younger folks, the people who have different uh, gender orientation really do feel a certain, certain threat. Uh, within Southern Thailand, within the Muslim community. And I think it's really important that we uh, speak up uh, more on this issue, particularly among the Malay Muslims. And that's what I, I have been uh, trying to do. Uh, my, 
Well, there, there's actually a movie right now. Uh, it's an independent film being shown in Hao Samyan, which is next door at Samyan Midtown, right? The, the top level is an independent uh, cinema. Uh, it's called Solid by the Seashore, uh, talking about young Muslim girl from Songkla uh, meeting her female friend artist and struggling. Uh, she came from a very conservative uh, background, but but also end up questioning her, her gender orientation. So we sponsor uh, a film actually, uh, help, help, help facilitate the happening of this film. The, the act, lead actress is my sister-in-law, the script writer is my cousin, and then there we won uh, two awards in, in Busan. So I really hope you go and see it tonight. Or uh, I have, I don't know if we have time to show some trailer, we, we can uh, look at it uh, after this. I really hope you, and that, that's one thing I, I try to do, not in the political hat, but more of a, uh, 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 public uh, diplomacy kind of thing to open this room so that this issue uh, can be talked about. It's also really important to, to, to realize that, you know, a young female who may end up liking a person of the same gender orientation as her, actually most of the time they don't want to leave Islam, right? They don't want to re leave religion, but they still see some beauty in, in, in the world, all pictures of what it means to be a Muslim. So it's really important to, to find a space for these people as well, whether it doesn't have to be Islam, uh, Christian. I think the, 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 the Catholic community have done quite well uh, with the leadership of the Pope, but I hope other minorities uh, groups can, can also uh, create this, this opening for, for, for those minority of the minority to feel uh, belong and, and don't feel that they have to be chased away. So that's my personal hat, right? On, on the political side, I, I, this will be my, my last point. On the political side, I have been involved a little bit uh, with the form formulation of the foreign policy of the Move Forward Party. And I want to say that there is some hope there, right? I mean, we, we push the agenda really quite progressive uh, and we won the elections, although we didn't get to, 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 to run the government. But, but the, the fact that we won the election is already uh, quite remarkable and, and it speaks to the level of the, of the population, the Thai people here, how they accept uh, new norms. And, and the, the central thesis of how the, the, the policy for, for Move Forward was formed is really on human security. Right? Kun Pita have posted the term human security several times publicly online and he's spoken it, uh, he has speaking, spoken about it several times. We're trying to change the narrative of, of uh, in international relations, in foreign policy, you usually think of state as the unit of analysis. We try to shift that away to, to people, that it should be the people as well, not just state. And then particularly on the issue of Myanmar, we try to push that, that, that idea that, that it should be human security. And human, human security is, is the underlying foundation of human security is, is the four freedoms. And because of this, we push this and we won. And I think you, I, I want to leave you with that, the fact that there is hope out there. We went so far as actually proposing uh, Southeast Asia Human Rights Court in, 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 in the manifesto. Uh, we admittedly, when we wrote that, we thought we would come second and we'll make a lot of noise, but we actually won. So that, that is a testament of how the population, how the Thai electorate uh, voted. Uh, we, we, when we won the election, we thought like, oh, we owe it to the people to push this agenda and then maybe Marcos can be the one who rejected us, but uh, it's about planting the flag, right? So just want to leave you with that, that, with that, with that, that there is some hope out there. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you very much. And in keeping with the principles of equality, I would like to open the space for seven minutes, the same amount <laughs> that was given this morning. So seven minutes of Q&A. Anybody from the, from the floor? Yes? <laughs> uh, Ambassador Kassit, could, could... Okay. Indonesia. What, what can we do? Thank you. <laughs> I am a bit concerned about the rising political Islam in Indonesia and Malaysia. 
what are the views of the panelists and what can we do together to minimize this? Thank you. Okay, being a Malaysian is very challenging to tackling these um, questions. Very interestingly that in the past many, many years ago, Malaysia used to look at Indonesia as a model when it comes to the diversities. But now it seems like um, um, Indonesia is no longer the model for the uh, Malaysia when we look at the uh, Islam and uh, politics as well. I would say I do not have any ideas on how to minimize this except to have a leader that has integrities and to have a leadership in the countries that actually understand the religious diversities rather than using religion and race as a tool. Because in the country, in, in Malaysia for instance, the issues of race, uh, royalty, religions has become so controversial and being used by the politicians to say that we should be careful when we talk about race, religions and royalty. But I do not see that as in a positive light when we cannot discuss about these issues openly. When we are not able to have freedom of expression in talking about it, all of us understanding hate speech. But there should be a level of the uh, open discourse that being uh, available uh, to the people to actually talk about this. Without that kind of space, without the right leader, unfortunately, I think it will continue to be used as a tool for their political um, benefits. Yeah. Done. My question is addressed to Fuhadi, uh, Fuhadi about um, the foreign policy, especially the setting up of the ASEAN Human Rights Court. Uh, for me, it seems that it's the first time that the Thai political party put you know, foreign policy, especially including ASEAN, and including the ASEAN Human Rights Court. My question is, how, what is the, what are the rationale behind? Because it's quite exceptional. Uh, we use the term Southeast Asian Human Rights Court. We didn't use the term ASEAN. So that is, that is quite a deliberative, right? It, it's more of a coalition of the willing of who who would participate. Uh, we were hoping uh, Anwar would participate. <laughs> we were hoping uh, uh, maybe uh, three or four countries may participate, and that is, is enough for us, right? Uh, I think the idea is more about to, to plant the flag uh, and, and to, to really push this agenda forward. And we owe it to the people. Uh, and the, the rationale is quite simple because I think the under 40s now, the younger people, they, they care a lot less about state as a boundary that, that limits our who we care for, who we identify with. The advent of the internet, the advent of the, the penetration of information, I think make those borders a little bit blurry, right? I mean, we identify with a lot of people cross border, sympathize with those people suffering in, in Myanmar. And because of that, underlying foundation of the youth and I think drawing inspiration from that and it, turning it into a policy and that is the result of, of, of that younger generation of how we see uh, the world, right? I have to emphasize again that I speak informally. I help them, the party, informally so I speak on my own uh, personal capacity and that's the foreign policy aside, right? There are elements of human rights that, that, that have been pushed forward by, by the party as well. Uh, right now, actually, as we speak, there is a parliamentary session deliberating on same-sex marriage. Uh, and, and I think it is starting to become a bipartisan issue uh, in the sense that I think most people agree that, that, that it should go forward. The struggle, the struggle, I have said this before, uh, among the Muslim MPs uh, because of their constituency, because of their background. Uh, that's why I, I think we really have to move beyond this. And there is a possible rationalization of, of why a Muslim MP can vote for this bill. Uh, the reason I gave 
uh, some of my colleagues, my friends who are Muslim MPs, uh, why they can, why they would be able to vote for this bill, is because they should look of it at it as a tit for tat strategy, right? For example, if there will be a, bi a bill that is beneficial to to Muslims, to Christian, to ethnic, uh, to ethnic or religious minority in Thailand, those bills will not pass without MPs who are of who believe in Buddhism voted for us too. So, so I think they should look at this at, at, at this from an angle of an exchange of a, it's okay to be personally principal, but also vote along what the people of Thailand want it to be. With the rationale being that next time, whatever that is beneficial to us, to, to the Muslims, to the religious minority, will also be supported by the majority. I think because of that principle, I think it's okay. And, and I think they, they, they ought to grow beyond the confinement of what, it, what the traditional Islamic belief and, and separate between personal belief and, and state of Thailand that with Buddhists as, as a majority, I think. Yeah. Thank you. Last question from the audience at the back. Yeah, we have one minute left, but anyway. Who's oh. another one there? Yes. Oh, okay. Uh, my name Leonie. Uh, my name is Leonie from CFC. I think my question is. Uh, I I want to ask a question to Bu Yinghui. Yeah. Recording in progress. Uh, Bu Yinghui, nice to meet you again. Uh, I'm really interested with your present uh, with what your presentation today about the freedom of worship and also how uh, the how the impact to education by involvement of religion in the curriculum. So my question is more to the academic freedom perspective. Like I know that you are working in academic freedom and also your position as an academic. Do you think the dominant religions and also maybe the involvement of religion to the curriculum impacted to the uh, academic freedom and also you, your, your position as an uh, academic itself? Like what do you think about it? Is it an intersection between the religion and also the academic freedom? Thank you so much. Thanks, uh, Leonie, for the um, questions. So I'm going to use the uh, um, university setting. Actually, uh, before I came here, I have a really interesting uh, conversation with my students in one of the presentations. So we were talking about Black Lives uh, Matters and how has Black Lives Matters impact on uh, uh, the movements in Malaysia or whether is there any influence because we are talking about uh, majorities and minorities. So uh, what, well, not to say surprised me, what disappointed me was one of the answer coming from a student is that I come from a majority, so I do not understand the issues of minorities. So that was, for me, as a failure of the education system itself. And uh, it was rather uh, depressing for me, to be, uh, to be frank. But when it opened up to the uh, um, uh, broader dimensions on the academic freedoms, I think um, uh, to talk about religions and uh, human rights in the academic settings, while well, the reality is that I think educators work within, uh, without, if you do not have sufficient support coming from your universities and the institutions, well, I would say some scholars take their own risk uh, in terms of uh, saying the things that they, they do and so forth. So I would say in a setting that is not that democratic, um, how to protect that academic freedom is always to uh, have these uh, uh, conversations uh, in the classroom, uh, at least to say that what we discuss here remains within uh, inside the classroom so that we have this open space and at the same time to nurture the discussion as well because I think uh, as I, how I answer the uh, uh, issues about the political Islams in Malaysia I think the open space is really important so uh, I think the academic freedoms continue to be rather um, challenging and talking about education itself and even if you're talking about we want to do away with the religious education in Malaysia try and do that and see what happens 
that's why I also answer about the three R's, which for me is unhealthy uh, in terms of putting a policy to say that we should be very cautious. I mean, that is understandable, but we should have that environment that is friendly to all of us. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. I think it's, uh, it's about the time. Uh, uh, throughout this uh, panel discussion, we have listen to so many you know intersecting ideas uh, we learned that both freedoms are multi-dimensional and there's also of course a debate between universal standards and local realities how these freedoms are you know disproportionately affect uh, vulnerable uh, in, in particular women and LGBTQI and how um, you know, the act, different actors, especially the government and also the emerging roles of business uh, enterprises play on limiting or restricting the freedom of, of express, expression and speech. And also, we also learned about how we should promote a more inclusive human rights education and promote for the more open space for the society. So all these intersectional um, issues, I cannot do justice in summarizing all of them, but uh, it, I'm sure it gives you a broader perspective on how these two interrelated freedoms are interlinked and, and related. Um, but last but not least, before I end, the House of Samyan is next door, so <laughs> tonight. All right, um, we, I think the program has a break of 15 minutes, so uh, we'll come back after 15 minutes or maybe 10 just to keeping up with the schedule. So maybe 3.10, coming back for the next session. Can we play the trailer when, during the break? So. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good afternoon once again. We'll start with our last panel discuss discussion for today. Topic is promoting and protecting the four freedoms in ASEAN. So earlier we've been uh, hearing about discussions on the four freedoms. There had already been reference on promotion and protection within the ASEAN, but this panel will definitely focus on how do we promote and protect these four freedoms in ASEAN. And we have a good mix in our panel for this afternoon. Uh, we have the former Foreign Minister of Thailand, His Excellency Kasit Piromya. We have, to my uh, right, the former representative of Thailand to the ASEAN Intergovernmental Commission on Human Rights. He's a member of the UN Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights Committee and appointed expert to the high-level panel for the review of the terms of reference of the ASEAN Intergovernmental Com Commission on Human Rights. Dr. Siri Nanthasut, although some of my colleagues would always call him Doc, uh, Doc Sherlock Holmes. I hope uh, you also see the resemblance. <laughs> to my left, we have the former representative of Malaysia to the ASEAN Intergovernmental Commission on Human Rights, Edmond Bon. And to my far left is Dominic Virgil, the human right, a human rights researcher from Indonesia. Okay, may I now invite His Excellency Kasit Piromya for his uh, remarks. Uh, in the interest of time, I will be giving everyone 12 minutes uh, so that we have a few more minutes for open discussion. Go ahead, sir. First of all, I would like to thank the organizers and their organization for the invitation and for giving me the honor. Not much to come and talk, but to come and learn. And I think I have somewhat succeeded because we have had an excellent series of panel discussions. So thank you very much to all the panelists for the information and for the point of view. And I think for the general optimism for our common future in Southeast Asia. I have come here to participate, but I have not prepared a written speech because I wanted to come in here and make a sort of a, some sort of reaction and also to add to that some of my views and so on. And I think since this morning, I think a couple of words that caught my attention First is the word coalition. Second is more or less the
political regime in each of the ASEAN member states. And the, I think the nature of the ASEAN community itself. And I therefore do believe that the four freedoms have not been able to move much inside of each of the ASEAN country and inside the ASEAN community as a whole. For the very fact that six of the member states are authoritarian and the other four are semi-authoritarian and the only recognized democratic entity is the newest member of ASEAN, namely East Timor or, or, or Timor-Leste. And I would like to, I think, congratulate the Timorese people after all of that hardship and so on, being a colonized country two times, and finally has been able to stand tall in the international community with the, one of the highest rating as a democratic entity. And yet it is more or less the smallest country inside Southeast Asia. A bit, even the population is less than Singapore, although a bit of land area. But in terms of poverty and all of that and so on, it has been able for the past few years to move along the era, within the era of globalization and as well as to maintain a democratic regime. I think to the satisfaction of its own citizens and some, for something that should be emulated by the neighbors here and far and especially by friends inside the global south. And if East Timor can do that, can do it, then why not the rest of the ASEAN member states? So my point is that for the four freedoms to move forward, it is imperative that each one of them have to get rid of any authoritarian characteristic and become more and more a democratic society. And at the same time, concurrently or simultaneously, ASEAN community must have a drastic transformation to become a regional cooperation organization based on the principal ideals of democracy. Maybe in the way of the, what the Europeans have been able to achieve through the setting up of the European Union, first from the coal and steel economic community to the European economic community, common market to the Eurozone, and finally, to the European Union based on the principle of human rights and democratic principle. Again, if the Europeans could do it, then why not the ASEAN community? And we cannot really realize the four objectives of the human rights, the four freedoms, and unless and until we are all become democratic entities. But it would be, I think, a sort of a dream, a delusion, if we think that we could go and change the mindset of Somdet Hun Sen and his son, Somdet Hun Manet, or to change the so-called Politburo of the Laotian Communist Party, which is more or less a combination of a political dynasty within the Communist Party. 
or to change the mindset of some, or I think practically all except maybe the Move Forward Party of all the political leaders of Thailand and the mentality and the mindset of the bureaucratic and military and police establishment of the Kingdom of Thailand as well as the so-called Thai Chinese business family conglomerates that it would be better for the future of the Kingdom of Thailand if we were to work together to move forward what we had started on the 24th of June 1932. It's already 91 years. We still have not reached the level of democratic entity of what I think East Timor has already achieved. Indonesia more or less is on the way. Malaysia is doing much better. And Taiwan, South Korea and Japan had all gone far and far into the realization of all types of freedom and the respect for the human dignity. So my thesis is that we all have to work together for the democratic transformation inside each of the ASEAN member states and also inside the ASEAN community as a whole. But I will not place my bet or rely on the vision, aspiration of the political leaders because so far most of the political scene inside the ASEAN community is more or less being dominated and directed by a set of political dynasties. Uh, the most disappointing one was the latest one in, on the, in Indonesia where the present president has successfully pushed his son at the age of 36 to become the vice presidential candidate. That could not have happened if that were to be, I think, the case of a democratic society. But this political dynasty is also in Indonesia in the making. And the president could not go to sleep and to die eventually without ensuring that one of his sons would be the next president of Indonesia. And then that is the beginning of the destruction of all the democratic principles of Indonesia. I hope my Indonesian friends will wake up to that and deter this type of the political dynasty continuity in political power. It would be detrimental to democracy in general and to the people of Indonesia as a whole. So the work and the responsibility from my point of view would have to come back to the various civil society organizations, to the people's movement. We have to work within a coalition inside each of our respective country and cross border to have a big coalition of Southeast Asians, NGOs and civil society organization to push for democracy for the human security, human dignity, for the human rights, and so on. And I think we can do it if we put our hearts and mind uh, together. And this particular meeting, I think under the auspices of the, I think the working group on ASEAN human rights? Mechanism. Yeah, mechanism. Expand that, why not? And at the same time, we will push, we will, I think, liaise with the National Human Rights Commission, especially of Thailand, Malaysia, Indonesia, and Philippines, because these four entities are quite independent from the political masters. And inside the ASEAN uh, Intergovernmental Commission, only these four countries have the commissioners that were, I think, se selected or elected on the basis of individual competition and not being appointed and nominated either by the Communist Party of Laos, Vietnam or by the big power in being like the name of Somdet Hun Sen and all of this and so on or senior general Min Ong Lai and so on uh, you know it was not done on a democratic basis ignoring human rights principle altogether then how can you have a commissioner 
that did not come from the sort of the human rights or democratic world point of view to come and work for the greater glory of ordinary ASEAN citizens on the question of democracy and human rights. So I think we have to do more of the networking, working together, not only to meet every six months, but to do the work together within this coalition partnership 365 days a year, maybe for the next five to 10 years until we reach the objective the, car, the target of a full-fledged ASEAN democratic transformation, both at the ASEAN organizational level and inside each of the individual ASEAN member states. So the freedoms, the four freedoms, will only be realized only within a democratic context. An authoritarian regime of any kind, a family one, a personality cult one, a military general one, you know, a few, I think, wealthy business families financing a political process. All of these authoritarian, semi-authoritarian will not only be able to promote the full freedom, but it will also undermine and destroy the four freedoms. So my last point, let's wake up together and let's work together. And I am more than ready to offer my services to the full. I am out, fully out of politics for the past five and six years and so on. I have no political ambition, but I have one political ambition to see a full-fledged democratic kingdom of Thailand soon, as well as a democratic ASEAN community. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good evening. Okay. Uh, thank you, Excellency, for um, bringing us really to the reality of where we are. <laughs> We hear your frustration eh, coming from uh, your years of experience within the system and as a political leader yourself. But I think let us not uh, forget the challenge and the glimmer of hope there. The challenge that uh, we have to overcome this, uh, we have to work together. And I think the glimmer of hope, especially for the younger generations. And uh, speaking of the younger generation's excellency, I am surrounded by the younger ones, right, Edmond? <laughs> he doesn't want to agree, but uh, we go young, youngerish. Okay, so we go now to Dr. Siri. <laughs> Good afternoon. This is a bit of a game theory because we didn't prepare each of us what the trajectory of uh, presentation we are going to uh, convey. So. I need to bear in mind of the broader experience of Kunkasit, the similar background between me and Edmund being lawyers, and the academician point of view uh, of uh, Dominique. Uh, so bear with me. There may be repetition and overlap in our presentation. But I'm very glad to hear Kunkasit uh, providing a, a very broad overview of his vast experience and, and point of view. Uh, let me first uh, provide this disclaimer that, number one, this is uh, all my personal point of view, and number two, um, you know, uh, our moderator uh, specifically presented a, a position of uh, be, I'm being part of uh, the group that will review the TOR, the AICHA. Let me explain to you that I haven't started the work because as you may know, uh, not every ASEAN member state has appointed one. So we need to have 10. Um, and for the past three years, maybe four, I don't remember how many years it's passed now, since 2019 uh, that I was appointed, I haven't started to work to review the, ter the terms of reference of the AICHA. I'd like also to recognize my former colleague, uh, Padra Fendi, and also Shanti, who I'm very glad to see. Now, let's begin. I like to actually reiterate the fact that when we talk about four freedoms, we need to remember the speaker of the words. I like to talk about the Roosevelt first. 
the first one to talk naturally is the, um, you know, the, the speaker himself. And I like to focus on the, on the last two freedoms. In his word, he said, the third is freedom from want, which translated into world terms means economic understandings, which will secure to every nation a healthy peacetime life for its inhabitants everywhere in the world. The fourth is freedom from fear, which translated into world terms, means a worldwide reduction of armaments to such a point and in such a thorough fashion that no nation will be in a position to commit an act of physical aggression against any neighbor anywhere in the world. He uttered these words in 1941, shortly before Japan bombed Pearl Harbor, which triggered um, formally the US engagement in World War II. And of course, his speech um, is predicated upon the term multilateralism before the US re-engaged in world politics. So, and this preceded the establishment of the UN itself in 1945. The other Roosevelt I like to talk about in recognition of her contribution to world human rights system is Eleanor Roosevelt. Of course, we know her, and thanks to this event, we need to remember her contribution in the sense that she chair the drafting group for the UDHR, which we are celebrating the 75th year of today. Actually, a quote that I like to mention is not pertained specifically to human rights, but she said, learn from the mistakes of others you cannot live long enough to make them all yourself. So I really like this phrase, and I remember uh, the two Roosevelt in this context. Now, let's come to um, ASEAN. Um, when when the, I read the heading and said, for promoting and protecting the four freedoms of ASEAN, in ASEAN, it assumes a number of things. Number one, that ASEAN has its own agency. ASEAN is its own actor when talking about promoting and protecting the four freedoms. Of course, ASEAN is a fully-fledged actor in terms of you know, being a protector and promoter of human rights. For some years already, we have a fully-fledged mechanism, however a flaw that may be, we have a mechanism uh, to assess. Um, I like also, within the very short limit of time, talking about each pillar to assess how successful we have been. Overall, I need to say that when we formed in 1965, we were facing with um, the threat of communism, and we passed that milestone quite well. Now, what kind of threats are we facing? Yesterday and today, the two choking points of the world are presenting different forms of security threats. In the Red Sea, we see a group of Hittites um, you know, threatening to bomb any ships passing the Red Sea, which diverts traffic from the Red Sea to the Panama Canal, which is facing a different threat, the environmental threat, because of drought that is facing, the, the region is facing, is causing a traffic jam in Panama Canal. How does this relate to us? It will relate to us because the natural gas and, and oil in general pass through these two straits. So the price of oil and gas may be increased, and that will impact our lives. This just shows how interconnected we are, and interconnected and inter interdependent we really are in ASEAN. When we talk about security, we, talk, we often talk about the pillar one, the first pillar of ASEAN. Um, I just want to remind us that um, from ASEAN being an actor in security term and harking back to the words of Roosevelt, we know that he focused uh, a lot about human security, and I'm sure that you heard about human security throughout the day. How can we live in ASEAN alongside the 10 member states with no fear of being threatened by traditional or non-traditional security threats? How can ASEAN be a, an effect, effective actor in that respect? We know that ASEAN is being res, um, expected to play more and more role in intra-regional security from the case of Thai and Cambodia um, um, conflict of um, Pravihi or Pravihan. Um, as the words of Kun Kasit actually reminds me of when um, Myanmar revolution or coup occurred and people ask Thailand how do we need to react. 
which reminds me of another word of another former foreign minister, Kunnitya Pibun Songkram. When he was asked the same question when he was alive, he said, using the phrase of today's term, we cannot decouple from Myanmar. That's essentially his word. How can we decouple from Myanmar? He said, we had the burden of proximity. We can't simply relocate ourselves to live in another sphere of the world, free of any kind of threat. We need to live together. You know. So um, in peacetime and in conflict time, how effective can ASEAN be in helping more and more managing uh, the balancing act of uh, the threats that uh, ASEAN is, uh, is facing more and more. I keep this pending. Pillar two, we are seeing deeper and deeper economic integration, as, thanks especially to ASEP. My question is, if ASEAN is an actor, and ASEAN is in economic sphere, how can ASEAN address the adverse impact of its own economic integration? through the lens of business and human rights, through the human rights mechanism. We don't see a clear role that the AICHA can play in this sphere, I have to say, frankly. Uh, if you look at the ASEAN, uh, you know, ASEAN Human Rights Declaration, we, and I keep smiling when I'm looking at this stack of books, uh, the, the nine uh, human rights treaties, uh, and they are all incorporated in our human rights declaration, and part of Fendi knows this well because he was engaged in the, in the negotiation. How can we make sure that when we talk about adverse impacts of economic integration, ASEAN is fully cognizant of the, the impacts that it has created and bad responsibility through the you know, human security terms? The last pillar is about um, social and cultural. My words, I, I, before I, my time ends, I want to say about um, the promotion of cultural identities and diversity, which we don't see happening here. We, the only thing that we see strongly from ASEAN side is the ASEAN Games, and that's the area of sport, which shows a lot of diversity. But we don't see ASEAN as an actor, as an active actor in promoting cultural diversity. I have a former friend who is a former special rapporteur on indigenous peoples from the Philippines. Uh, regrettably, I don't see any role. Uh, can we have a special rapporteur on cultural identity or cultural diversity in ASEAN? The other day on the, third, on the fourth, sorry, on the fifth of December, when we celebrated the International Day of Persons with Disability, I kept calling for ASEAN to bear in mind that there are groups of people especially people with disabilities, who want representation, who want participation in many fields, security, economic, and cultural. Why can't we have special rapporteur on persons with disabilities in ASEAN? So I just, I don't have a, a fair, complete, or full assessment. I just want to show you that my message is ASEAN is a full actor in these fields. We must assess the effectiveness of the mechanism of the institutions of ASEAN, I'd like to end by actually posing this question. What will post-2025 vision of ASEAN look like? Do we know? We need to know now. But we don't see documents forthcoming. We don't, we don't see the engagement, the possible engagement of people's ASEAN to provide contribution to the drafting process of the post-2025. The other day, I kept calling for the same message that you can't actually having a, you know, an echo chamber or a closed meeting room where the 10 the representatives of ASEAN simply uh, negotiate among themselves what ASEAN will look like post-2025 or even post-2030. And right now people are talking about what it will be like after 2030. So ASEAN need to bear in mind the trajectory and we need to bear in mind as well that participation will be a key to the legitimacy of ASEAN in the long run. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sri. While he was, uh, while he was uh, giving his speech, and um, I got struck with uh, ASEAN is a full actor. It made me think of uh, the emperor who was wearing nothing. Uh, and uh, it, it seems that 
from what was mentioned by uh, uh, Minister Cassit uh, earlier, that if uh, we, we have a dynastic ASEAN and the ASEAN thinks full of itself without bearing in mind the real constituency of ASEAN, then really uh, the emperor has no clothes. It's surrounded by people praising ASEAN when in reality it is making a fool of itself to the detriment of the peoples within ASEAN. So thank you, Dr. Siri. With that, let's move on now to Edmond, soon to be Dr. Edmond as well, I hope, by uh, next year. <laughs> Hopefully. Hopefully. Um, thank you, Api. I will just go a bit uh, more traditional uh, in terms of approaching the question of how we can practically um, be more effective in protecting human rights. Uh, the Working Group for the ASEAN Human Rights Mechanism uh, was one of the key actors that she had pushed for the AICHA that was set up uh, in 2009. And if you look at what uh, a lot of academic articles and advocacy has been uh, focusing on, we're looking at three different types of mechanisms. One would uh, be the Commission, which is the AICHA. Two would be the Human Rights Court, which is uh, something I think a lot of people have given up hope on. But third, I, I, I think we have forgotten about, and the working group, uh, uh, I think yesterday had a strategy meeting, uh, to talk about how we can reignite and revive uh, a discussion on having an ASEAN binding Human Rights Commission. So apart from talking about a mechanism in terms of an institution like the Commission, which uh, Dr. Sri has mentioned about and reviewing the TOR, the foot dragging since 2009 for appointments, uh, but I need to say Malaysia had appointed their, their experts already, uh, but then he became an ambassador in Belgium, uh, but we still have an expert. I think a few other countries have not, uh, but the foot dragging has been a method of delaying the TOR's uh, review because we know that there are countries like Malaysia, Thailand, Philippines, and I think Indonesia that wants a more uh, uh, expanded mandate for protection. But I want to just go back to this binding convention on human rights because uh, the AICHA in its uh, formative years, and I think Rafendi and uh, Sri Papa and uh, Dr. Suri, uh, as well, not my time, but uh, led, I think, by the Philippines as well, had a few forums and discussions on what type of uh, human rights convention we should have. And um, RP as well, I think Eteneo had organized some of these events with AICHA Philippines. I wanted to put it out there because I think uh, there needs to be a revival of that discussion, uh, more so because the ASEAN has signed up to the three conventions, 10 countries, and I believe timor Leste as well. timor Leste probably has signed up to... To, 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 to more than any others. I think Malaysia is uh, really put to shame because we've only got three. Uh, women, children, and uh, persons with disabilities. Uh, and even with uh, the committee that uh, Dr. Sri is on, uh, ICSCR, I was just checking on the internet just now. Um, we have seven countries, uh, seven countries that have signed up uh, in ASEAN. Uh, only Malaysia, Singapore, and Brunei have not signed up, but uh, Brunei normally follows what Malaysia does. So if you have Malaysia and Singapore signing up, you probably have 10 countries on uh, economic, social, cultural rights. Uh, and I think focusing on binding human rights conventions, the issue of freedom uh, from one, uh, looking at uh, inequality, looking at standard of living, health, education, um, water and sanitation, social security and welfare, and we see the sessions in the morning, you will be able to, I think for me, uh, practically uh, look at those a bit more, um, how would you say, a bit more acceptable issues that are not too controversial. You have a binding convention that deals with those issues uh, and including the rights of women, children, and disabilities. That's something that uh, I wanted to say um, in terms of putting it out there. Uh, in terms of other protective mechanisms, which I will not go into detail, but you have uh, the mechanisms for special repertoire. I think the, um, uh, when we were drafting, and Dr. Sri led the enabling master plan for disabilities rights, uh, there was some discussion within the ASEAN task force as to whether we need to have a repertoire for that. 
Uh, so the special repertoire type of position and mechanism for ASEAN may be another option. Uh, we can look into fact-finding missions uh, that will allow for reporting into different countries' uh, situation. And also, of course, uh, with general comments. These are different type of uh, uh, roles and activities that actually can be taken, can, can actually take place without, uh, uh, with, within a, a, a proposal for a binding human rights convention. But I want to uh, just caution uh, the idealism uh, here. Uh, we have a Hayes Convention that has been enforced for the longest time, uh, purport purportedly a human rights convention because it deals with uh, pollution. Uh, but yet, there is no mechanism, uh, and there's no mechanism that can be used to enforce that agreement. We have um, a legally binding uh, anti-trafficking in persons convention as well, which purportedly is also a human rights convention because uh, anti-trafficking is mentioned in the AHRD. But again, we see that there is no uh, enforcement mechanism. The arguments very quickly uh, that you see from countries that are against these type of mechanisms are fivefold. Uh, just to end, one is non-interference. The answer is non-interference in ASEAN, while it still applies in practice, you can see from Myanmar, we are prepared and will be prepared to exclude countries and still go ahead without uh, all 10. Uh, two, uh, we don't have, some countries have said we have we don't have same legal systems, but yet in ASEAN we have agreements uh, that transcend those different legal systems. Third, we have arguments about peace. So the argument will be that because there is uh, human rights, we, we, we need to be very careful to have um, um, justiciable human rights because we need to have peace. Against that, again, that argument is a mismatch. Uh, I think the fourth argument is that there's no baseline. The argument against the no baseline is that there is the Conventions on the Rights of Women, Children and Disabilities. And the last argument, uh, I can't read my own handwriting here, but uh, uh, we are, yeah, so I think, let me find out what I, I wrote here. But anyway, there are, there are four arguments, uh, and there are four arguments against it. I pass it back to Api. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Edmund. Um, I think uh, your intervention and uh, uh, Minister Kassid's intervention complement each other. Uh, from the reality, uh, Edmund has been a, a dreamer in terms of coming up with all these mechanisms. And I think this is part of why we're here. Watch, let's smiling and Sumita. You don't agree? I think we are... We are all dreamers. That's why we are human rights advocates here. We are optimists. We do know the realities, but we need to dream and we need to work towards those dreams. Uh, but I think one thing that Edmund pointed out is ASEAN is uh, commitment phobic. <laughs> uh, proof of it, after it, the Bangkok Declaration in uh, 1967, it took 40 years before it decided, let's get married, the ASEAN member states, and had a binding treaty in uh, 2007. And Edmond has been mentioning binding treaties because we have a lot of declarations that had been mentioned earlier, and yet uh, there's a lot of inaction, uh, lack of implementation. So it's nice, again, to set our goals into what are the possibilities, what do we want to achieve? And that's where the coalition comes in. Uh, uh, can yes. I interject just, just two points of information to react to, uh, um, quickly react to Edmund's point. Number one is we have another um, so-called treaty, uh, which is the anti-terrorism treaty convention, which lacks um, enforcement mechanism. The other thing I'd like to mention in response to Kun Kasit as well, that um, I have this page for some time now. This is Article 30 from the African Union uh, Charter. And Article 30 says it's on suspension. It says, governments which shall come to power through unconstitutional means 
shall not be allowed to participate in the activities of the union. And we had been, or we may have been, discussing a lot about the possibility of integrating this kind of provision in the ASEAN Charter as well. Thank you. Okay, it just shows that Dr. Siri also wants to be that dreamer of having someone suspended within ASEAN. Eh? He wants to be the principal. Okay, so now we go to Dominic. Go ahead, Dominic. Uh, thank you. Good afternoon, Excellencies, colleagues. So, uh, yesterday, Dr. Sri Papa introduced me as the youngest speaker, so I'm just gonna speak as young as possible. <laughs> just kidding. So, uh, my name is Dominic, I'm from Indonesia. Uh, now, I'm actually working in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs uh, of, of the Republic of Indonesia, but I'm here uh, representing uh, my own. I'm uh, representing, I'm so talking in my personal capacity uh, because before entering uh, the ministry, I was working with Amnesty and other human rights NGOs. So, what I might say uh, will be a mix of those perspectives that I've gained over the years. I'm not as experienced as the other speakers, but uh, I learned uh, something along the way, and uh, I would like to share my views on what young people think about uh, the four freedoms and the human rights in ASEAN. So, uh, young people actually think in a very simple manner. Uh, for, for us, human rights only mean two elements. First is the norm setting on the international, regional, and the uh, practical level. And the second one is the implementation on the ground. So what I'll be speaking today only concerns those two elements. For the norm setting, uh, I wouldn't have to repeat myself. I think all the speakers, uh, all the participants already know what uh, the human rights uh, treaties frameworks that we already have in an international and regional level. Um, what I would like to point out is that the norm setting, be it in the international, regional, and national level, cannot be mutually exclusive with uh, the implementation and the practice on the ground. So as I've been um, communicating with my friends here, the participants as well, uh, it is important for ASEAN member states and ASEAN as a regional body to uh, communicate and to engage with uh, the stakeholders. Uh, the speakers before me mentioned that uh, there is a lack of uh, ASEAN community and identity. I respectfully disagree with that. I think ASEAN community is us, the young people, the civil society organizations, and we, we have a lot to bring on the table. And um, integrating us into uh, policy making will require a more consistent and frequent um, consultation. Uh, we cannot just be consulted when the law is ready, because uh, that's what I've experienced working within the ministry and when I was in NGO. So when the law is ready, the civil society is consulted, and then then. Uh, we don't get to see the follow-up of our request. We don't get to see the follow-up of our concerns, basically. So I think uh, the norm setting in the national level requires a multi-stakeholder uh, integration. And that is also true in the ASEAN level. Um, I think uh, we do have um, in place several uh, legally binding international frameworks on human rights. And we have uh, regional uh, human rights frameworks as well, be it binding or non-binding. I think the most important uh, thing that we as young people see is how it is being legislated nationally and how it is being implemented by uh, the uh, ministries and agencies. And I think that uh, it is such a huge homework for ASEAN. So I think um, if we push for uh, making or writing or establishing more conventions or more frameworks, it cannot be as effective uh, to improve the situation on the ground. What we need uh, for me as, uh, as a young person uh, working um, in the uh, ASEAN region is that we want to see uh, those commitments, those existing commitments be implemented uh, on the ground. Uh, so in that regard, uh, I do have prepared <laughs> some uh, pointers uh, for, for me to say. Um, I would like to first comment on the ASEAN mechanism itself. Uh, I am really appreciative of the fact that ASEAN already established the ITER, ASEAN Intergovernmental Commission on Human Rights. 
A um, few years ago, when uh, the terms of reference was discussed, I was actually helping HRRC in University of Indonesia to also give some inputs to that. Uh, but now, um, looking at the issue of human rights and its mechanism uh, from inside the ministry, I see that there seems to be some kind of like a disintegration of the discussion of human rights itself to solely be discussed in the IHR. So I'm not seeing the same importance to human rights being brought in other ASEAN sectoral bodies. So I think um, that is what uh, ASEAN needs to pay attention to. How, for example, under the APSC, the AEC, and uh, the ASEAN uh, SSC have their own sectoral bodies, we need to push more agenda on human rights to be discussed. Why? Because um, the outcome of uh, those ASEAN sectoral bodies are the ones that are being considered uh, by national member states. And I think that it's one of the things that we should push um, forward. Um, and uh, next uh, point that uh, I would like to highlight is that, as mentioned before, those um, discussions on the ASEAN level, it shouldn't be discussed in a vacuum. So there are also situations uh, on the ground that should be brought up, and I think I didn't see that enough in the outcome documents uh, of the uh, ASEAN sectoral bodies. So uh, that's my uh, next point. Uh, the last point um, is that uh, I think ASEAN as a body and uh, its member states, we need to be more uh, participative in the uh, international norm setting process. Um, and there are some challenges that, are, that we are facing. Um, I'm just going to mention a few. Um, first, uh, firstly, is uh, the climate change. Now in the, in, in, in the ICJ, the General Assembly already requested uh, the ICJ to um, issue an advisory opinion on climate change. And I think uh, if we see ASEAN, most of ASEAN member states are coastal states. So we have a lot of coastal communities that depend uh, our livelihood on the ocean. So we, for us, we may not be um, that close to those coastal communities living on the ocean, but the threat of climate change such as ocean acidification, ocean warming, uh, the sea level rise, it threatens uh, the very basic of the freedom of want of those coastal communities. So I think um, ASEAN, uh, whose member states are, are uh, very dependent on the ocean, need to be more involved in that. Um, and uh, the next point uh, that I will uh, underline is uh, another norm setting process in the ICJ concerning the uh, uh, legal consequences uh, arising from the policies and practices of Israel in the occupied Palestinian territory. Um, I think um, that uh, the ICJ already uh, mentioned and already issued an advisory opinion in 2004 regarding the legality of the wall itself, and uh, the ICJ will issue another advisory opinion on uh, the practice of Israel itself. Um, Indonesia, for example, we have been advocating for the issue of Palestine since uh, our independence, uh, so that I think ASEAN member states, uh, most of which are already experiencing the horrors of uh, colonization, we need to also uh, participate in this advisory opinion. Although it's non-binding, uh, in the future, if these advisory opinions, uh, both on climate change and Palestine, have already been issued, there may be um, a possibility of other states um, coming to ICJ and then solve interstate disputes um, in the ICJ, and then we cannot just be silent and not participate. And I think that is the important uh, point that we need to um, take into account. Uh, the next one is uh, the uh, recent acknowledgement of the right of a healthy environment. And I think it's part of the um, economic, social, cultural rights and the freedom of want itself, and the freedom of life, obviously. Um, I think for the UNHRC and UNGA, to acknowledge it uh, by adopting a resolution for, for me, 
uh, personally, it's quite late. So um, I think back in 1997, there has been already a concern on, on environment and how it is uh, impacting human uh, element and the society. And uh, there was also uh, those discussions in the 1972 Human Environment Conference and 1992. So I think um, this kind of uh, lag in the United Nations, uh, I think ASEAN can do better than that. So we need to step up uh, on that, I think, and, and uh, do some evaluation uh, on how, what kind of uh, issues and emerging challenges that we can first address in the regional basis. Uh, the next one is the protection of informal workers. Um, I see that you know some of us use Grab or Gojek, and the drivers, if you know, it's not listed as employees. They are listed as partners. So uh, every time I travel with Gojek or Grab, I always communicate with the driver. So they all complain about how they were not able to even fulfill the basic needs uh, daily because um, they work and they get paid based on bonus. And they don't have insurance. I mean, if they're lucky, they have, <laughs> but they don't. Uh, and they are excluded from the manpower law, in Indonesia at least, that's the case. So how these people can be protected, it's, I think it's up to the ASEAN member states because where the users uh, of ride-hailing apps are mostly in ASEAN countries. So I think this is something that's very close to us. I mean, without them, we cannot go anywhere now. So I think we, we have to uh, pay more attention to them and uh, domestic workers, um, especially since most of the domestic workers are women. Uh, I think uh, they are very uh, vulnerable to any kind of changes. They live uh, from paycheck to paycheck. And I think uh, when I communicated with them on a daily basis, because a lot of my colleagues, they still have domestic workers in their homes. When I talk to them, uh, it's really hard for them to actually survive uh, in, in, in uh, ASEAN, in Jakarta, for example. So I think that's also the uh, uh, thing that we should uh, uh, work together. And uh, I have two more points, two more issues that I would like to raise. Uh, the next one is the trade and sustainable development. So ASEAN, especially Indonesia, we are very... Um, we are very adamant and we are very um, you know, motivated to uh, have and to enter trade agreements, enter into trade agreements with a lot, a lot of countries. And one of the issues that is currently um, raising is how the sustainable development is included in the agreement itself. And one of the uh, element is labor. And uh, what my colleagues uh, working on the negotiation uh, talk about is the monitoring mechanism, how can uh, something such as labor be included in a free trade agreement or any kind of trade agreement and then the monitoring is um, given to you know, the partnering state without any kind of standard. So I think it will affect um, many workers in ASEAN countries uh, and I think that's, uh, that also needed to be uh, put into intention. And lastly, uh, I think as uh, young people, this is the uh, most relatable issue for young people. It's social media, personal data protection, cybersecurity, and misinformation. I think one thing that um, young people can uh, boast about is our skill to uh, grasp information very fast. And we are good at researching because a lot of sources are already available online. But then if we look at Gen Z, uh, the generation below me, our junior, I think, they are, the, the main source of information is the internet. So it's not books, uh, it's not other sources. So I think, although it's, it's, um, it's not as huge as, as it seems, but you know, they still need to be protected. I recall uh, a spread of misinformation and hatred and fake news surrounding Rohingyas are all incited by Gen Z Indonesians, which is sad. Because um, in many social medias, um, uh, there, there is even a fake account of UNHCR Indonesia spreading misinformation. And then a lot of Indonesian young people, they actually buy that. 
that Rohingyas are trying to Indone uh, are coming to Indonesia to steal our lands. Well, it's not the case. So I think um, this is something that uh, probably on a policy level uh, uh, should be addressed further. Um, I think for uh, me uh, as a youth representative, that's all for me, and I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing more from my uh, young people, colleagues here, and the participants, and uh, thank you. Okay, thank you, Dominic. Uh, truly the voice of the youth. I've heard Dominic also won uh, an essay, human rights essay writing contest when you were three years old in 2019, right? Yes. Yeah, okay. Yes, uh, but it, uh, listening to her, it made me remember what uh, Rafendi said. Uh, you came from Amnesty International, you said, AI? Yeah, back then. Back then, so NGO, next government official. He, she's now with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And uh, we do hope you, you've seen from the experience to the youth, we do hope that uh, as you grow older, you'll be as energetic, passionate, innovative, and I hope you would also implement all of your ideas. Huh? And that is where the challenge and hope comes in. Huh? Uh, now, and thank you, thank you for all those ideas, uh, Dominic. Now we open the panel for any interventions. Yes, go ahead. We have one, two, three, okay, four. So we'll take four Recording and then we'll, in go back. we'll go back to the panel. Hello. Um, hello, good afternoon, everyone. I am Jessica from uh, part of the Philippine Working Group for ICN Human Rights Mechanism. I'm also a part of the University of the Philippines Institute of Human Rights. So, um, uh, as mentioned earlier, there are three stumbling blocks that exist within the member states. These are the non interference, sovereignty, and preference for non binding documents. Now, I would like to ask, how would the ASEAN reconcile its goal as a full actor to effectively um, promote and protect these freedoms and the, and the existence of the said uh, stumbling blocks within the member state? Thank you, Jessica. What shall I? Oh, okay, thank you. I think it works now. RP, you're right in the sense that uh, we are still optimistic. We still think that we can make change, right? So, but the question about change is now critical, right? It, because we are definitely seeing rising conservatism and authoritarianism, not just within the region, but globally, right? I mean, everything that's happening. Oh, thanks. And then the other thing we are seeing um, that's happening is more and more the shrinking of spaces for expression. Uh, and then tied into that is also the role and powers of other actors uh, who actually reign supremacy, sometimes even over state, especially these big businesses and big tech companies, right? So in that context, how do we reclaim our space um, and the various spaces in the region? Do we continue within the ombud of ASEAN as a mechanism within the, its own structure? Because in addition to the, the three principles, there is also the veto power within the concept of consensus building, right? A consensus form of decision making. Do we do it within that, right? Uh, and on being part of this whole discussion since God knows how long, uh, we've always been somewhat uh, asked to compromise our standards. You know, as you know, we agreed on the charter, as we agreed on the TOR of ICHAR, even as we agreed on the ADHR, or oh, HRD, sorry, HRD. So, or do we think a little bit more uh, with our imagination and recreate our spaces by setting up parallel multi-stakeholder systems ourselves? Right? Because we're so highly dependent on the state, but can we pull our resources together, the different stakeholders we have within the region, and think about systems that we can own 
that is built on the principle, or rather anchored on the principle of people's participation. Uh, I think more and more, as we even get disillusioned with UN as a system, I mean, the reason Security Council fiasco uh, is, uh, is actually quite indicative of how UN has failed, or continues to fail. Do we want to have similar discussions here, or do we want to think a little bit more bigger? So back to the panel to see how can we think differently, how can we get this space back? Thank you. Thank you. Shanti. Thank you very much for this opportunity. I was going to respond to the speakers, but I want to give a quick response to Batsala's statement uh, right now. And that is her disillusionment with state-sponsored interventions uh, and actions. I agree with her disappointment with state-sponsored interventions as well as uh, UN. But I also want to say we don't have a choice to do something else because change can come, cannot come about unless governments reform themselves. No change can really, lasting change happen. So we have to see and understand this power imbalance in the geopolitical structures of the world. What can we do about it? That is one thing. The, the response that I wanted to give to the speakers was to our last passionate speaker, Dominic. She gave a very good analysis of uh, sampling blocks, the challenges, and so on. But I failed to see a gender perspective in that analysis. You know, when you talk about, yeah, when you talk about even in climate change, the CEDAW committee has come up with a general recommendation on natural disasters and climate change from a gender perspective. It's not well utilized, I'm afraid. Uh, so everything that happens in the world has a gender perspective, including informal sector labor, which has, uh, where there is no social security for workers, um, there is a gender perspective there. Uh, and therefore we need to have that perspective wo woven in into our analysis each time we speak. And one last point, we didn't, when we talked about the failure of the state or the lack of political will from the state, we didn't talk about corruption uh, in, within government circles and civil servants and so on. For me, my analysis is that when there is a lack of political will to bring about change, for example, in Malaysia, where the migrant worker situation is concerned, I think part of the problem is that the status quo will remain because government sector agencies, individual civil servants are benefiting from that inefficiency that is there because of corruption. They make a lot of money out of the system. And I think that has to be addressed as well. Will I stop? Thank you, Shanti. Emily? Thank you very much to, to the speakers. Thank you, Dominique, for speaking up for young people. Um, so um, I'd like to quote again Audre Lord. She said, the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. And she said that in 1979. Most of us young people were not even born. And here we are sitting in a room talking about the master's tools, trying to discuss the master's house, why the ASEAN is failing us. And so I agree with what you said, that I think it's time for us to reimagine the space, because my question to you is, when you were at your representatives, right, what got in the way when you have the power what got in the way for you to stand, in, to stand fully in solidarity with the people who need solidarity? What gets in the way for you to defer your power to those who need to be heard, to create the space for everybody to be able to, be able to engage with you? Because you know, not everybody gets invited to ICHR meetings, right? Not everybody gets ICHR CSO consultative status. If you're too vocal, you don't get it. So what gets in the way when you have this power 
to defy your power and to stand fully in solidarity with the people of ASEAN. The reason why ASEAN younger generation are delusion and don't fully believe in the ASEAN system any, anymore, it's because we are the only region without an ASEAN human rights court. I teach the protection of human rights in Asia every summer at the René Cassin Foundation in France. I compare the ASEAN with the African Union and with Latin America and Europe, of course. Everybody has a human rights court. What gets, what gets in the way for us to have one? I'm sorry, in Africa, they also have authoritarian governments, and yet they have an African human rights court. So what gets in the way if it's not power of states and power of the elite? So I'm, I'm talking to our representatives here. When you have that power, what gets in the way for you to defer it, to stand in solidarity with us, and to push fully for what we want, and to include us fully? Thank you. Thank you, Emily. And our last intervention, um, Rico, go ahead. If I may, perhaps I... ASEAN and the other uh, statewide uh, organizations are not providing the remedies to us right now. Now, if we wait for them to act, then we, we meaning we respectively, have to act on our own. So use the systems that you have. There are court systems, there are democratic systems that are within the system, work with them and on them. Let me just uh, re very quickly tell you what we're doing with MAD. You know that the Philippines is very, very backward in terms of democratic uh, principles. I think you know that. We now have a new president who was actually the son of the former dictator. But is it the end of the world for the Filipinos? No. We want to put up a front that we are actually fiscalizing the present government. How do we do that? Every time we see ills, any time that we needed to go to court for remedies, we go to court for remedies. I think you heard this morning that I'm actually prosecuting a former president of the Philippines for, for killing a lot of things. So, in other words, it's not actually defenseless. It's, not, uh, it's a matter for us, uh, the civil society people, the private society people. Let's not wait for the UN. Let's not wait for the ASEAN to do something about what we believe should be done right now and wait for another 25 years and we'll be talking about this again. Do something about it. Let's do something about it. Let's work under the system and make it workable for our own and have access to the remedies available. Now, you can also energize your legislators to come up with legislative reforms. Recently, we went to Congress and joined them to cancel a station, a cable station that's been red tagging many of our dissenters. That's what we do. And now, the House now decided to cancel that particular franchise of that. So it's a more of a self-dealing self or self-preventive kind of thing. So please, remember that, especially those who are not yet the democratic society that we are dreaming of. We can do it. And we need to come together, as I mentioned this morning, just come up with a community or the, the uh, civic society coalesce beyond borders and let's get together and have a cross-border cooperation so that we can do something about this without the help of the ASEAN, without the help of the UN. Let's do it. Thank you. Uh, I will now go to our panelists. Uh, we're actually over time. <laughs> so uh, with the indulgence of our panelists, uh, there are five interventions. You may address any or all if you can, uh, but kindly try to limit it within a minute. I'm really sorry, but uh, we're over time. <laughs> yes, uh, as much as possible, okay? And, um, and I just want to share that I'm so fortunate not answering any of these, just moderating, okay? 
Uh, Excellency, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, don't, don't be a bit so disappointed or impatient. If we were to go back to the ASEAN history, we together, ASEAN of the five and then Brunei the six, I think we were part of the victorious team that defeated the expansion of communism. Second, we did work together to remove Vietnam from the occupation of Cambodia and had the UN administration and the return or the beginning re-emergence of a democratic Kampuchea. Then we were able to expand ASEAN membership, bringing former enemies together as partner. And then we participated beautifully in the globalization processes and so on. Then we have the ASEAN Charter, then in the course of the year 2009, we did set up the ACHA, the ASEAN Master Plan for Connectivity. You know, and then on top of that, I think we have many countries around the world joining the Treaty of Amity and Cooperation. And coming down to the individual country, after 1998, beyond all expectation, the Indonesian people were able to put the military establishment back into the barracks after 30 years of supreme power. And I think Indonesia, as the largest Islamic country, is very democratic in spite of some of the problems here and there, as I mentioned, political Islam, but overall, it has been a very successful democratic entity indeed, and highly respected in the world at large. So, and so we could achieve a lot of things, and now we wanted to have the ASEAN Court of Justice. But I would like to remind that in the ASEAN Charter, the equivalent to the High Court is the, I think, High Authority of ASEAN. So far, we have not tested its viability because there have not been any court cases being brought to the High Court, uh, the High Authority of the ASEAN. Let, let's try that first and see whether that could move further into the establishment of the ASEAN uh, Court of of, of justice. But in all of this, what I have mentioned about the successful story was the, I think, the vision and the political will and the political decision to take all of the risk and so on. But what has been lacking for the past 10 years, more or less, is the lack of political leadership, the lack of the esprit de corps. And there is no one particular ASEAN level, either at the foreign minister or at the prime minister or presidential level, that took the mantle of the leadership to come out and lead the pact. And at the same time, allowing ASEAN to be dissected, especially the intervention of China into Vietnam, and especially to Laos, Cambodia, and into Myanmar. Because we could not keep the cohesion and we, because we don't really speak to one another, and we have allowed ASEAN to be undermined by the biggest neighbor of our, namely China. And maybe India is waiting in the wing, and if the Americans settle down the domestic problem, I think they will come back. So we, we, we will become again the arena for the big powers to do whatever they like with us. But we could prevent that unless when our political leaders come to their senses. But if they're not, then I think I join with Rodrigo that let's set up the government of the people, NGOs and so on. Let's work together and then become the force to be reckoned with that we could pressure all the political parties or the government inside the ASEAN community for them to work for the people at large. Thank you. Thank you, Excellency. Dr. Siri. Um, I don't know how to summarize, but just to say that um, I always lift this quote of Margaret Mead when she was asked um, what is a civilized, um, what is the birth of a civilization, she said, it's a broken femur that has healed. 
which is an evidence that another person has taken time to stay with the fallen. What should be the litmus test of the success of ASEAN? Um, you know, there's a question about stumbling blocks. There is a complaints about lack of engagement. There's a, a question about space. I, I just have one. We can assess about effectiveness of ASEAN, but to me, and I agree with Kun Kasit, that we need to look at the silver lining that ASEAN thus far has been a, a quite an effective platform for structured engagement. Uh, we, need, we have a terms of reference that whatever happens, we need to call one another in a platform, in an arena, and we need to engage. We can't simply go back and say, despite the fact that you know, um, we can individually, as a member state, decide what to do politically with, among ourselves, we need to engage with ASEAN. That's the rule. That's the you know, rule of engagement of today's term. Um, I, I think that one of the litmus tests that I like to see happening in ASEAN is that um, you know, I work on, on SDG 16 prior to my uh, um, exit from ASEAN, from AICHA. And uh, we were hoping that um, if one, an individual of ASEAN, uh, was charged in the court of law, a legal aid will be provided, no question asked. No means test, no poverty, no whatever. You, as a basis of being an ASEAN citizen, you will be provided with a legal counsel when you are charged with a criminal offence in another ASEAN country. I think that should be a, a good means test to us of how effective we've come thus far, not just in economic terms, but also in political and in human security terms as well. Uh, allow me to respond very quickly about the, the so-called the birth of clean air right. It has been there all the time since 1948, and this is a moment to celebrate the fact that Article 25 of the UDHR has a so-called adequate standard of living provision in place since 1948. And in the Inter International Covenant on Equal Social and Cultural Rights, Article 11, we have the provision on adequate standard of living. And the CESC has always maintained its position to declare that clean air is part and parcel of adequate standard of living, not just, you know, uh, housing, not just clothing, not just food, but also clean air. So it's a surprise to me, and, and, and I agree with uh, Dominique that it's a bit late. We don't need, actually we don't need that, because in international law it has been there to start with in the UDHR itself. It depends on your interpretation. Um, that's maybe, I, I don't know how to summarize, but just to say that to me, ASEAN, I celebrate ASEAN as a good platform. Otherwise, we couldn't be here. I couldn't see you. We couldn't meet. We go nation to nation. You know, I, I simply speak Thai. I don't speak English. I don't need to. I need to speak English so that I can communicate with you more clearly as an ASEAN, because we live in the same community. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sri. Edmond. Um, thank you for the comments and the questions. I think we go back to ask um, the strange question, comparing it with different regions how in ASEAN we had set up the ASEAN Human Rights Body and Commission before we had a treaty on human rights. Um, that is a very strange thing because it appeared that, the and some of you were on, on, on the panel uh, drafting the terms, uh, we have an ASEAN Charter and then we have uh, Article 14 that says set up the body and then it seems like the ASEAN leader said, go and set up the body, then only decide what rights the ASEAN peoples should have. If you compare that with how it has been in Europe, in inter-America, in, even in Africa, the agreement at the political highest level has been what those rights will be, whether rightly or wrongly. Here it's the other way around. And then when you, when you, have, that pro, when you have it at the other way around, uh, you have this problem of the AICHA when it first drafted the ASEAN Human Rights Declaration having all sorts of debates as to what rights should be included and what rights should not be. Now you have an ASEAN Human Rights Dec Declaration, albeit very weak, but yet you still have a commission because there was no firm grounding on a legally binding treaty uh, at that time uh, that is also, if I can say, all over the place. Uh, so if you ask me where we were we were trying to do as much as we can in our own different ways, but because it was 
uh, very difficult to say any of these rights were legally binding. A lot of the activities that we were doing were, in one sense, uh, more promotional, uh, and we don't still have a baseline uh, uh, among these other countries uh, as to how you define these rights. So even though we've signed up to CEDAW, CRPD, and um, the CRC, uh, the, we are still have countries, uh, especially the countries that are still resistant to human rights. And But also, also bear in, in mind, there are some countries that seem to be yeah. developed, but still are very sensitive about human rights. Uh, so we, th th this, this challenge about the baseline uh, is, is a huge challenge. Uh, it, it, people are still finding their way around, not least the first batch of AICHA. Uh, and that, that reminds me of my note that I now can read. The note that uh, I had was that uh, there are some countries that are not used to talking about human rights openly. Uh, so the argument is we will not want more human rights accountability because I'm not used to being criticised by my own people. Um, in essence, they are saying I'm not a democracy. So some ASEAN member states are, are actually saying I'm not a democracy. But they're not saying it in those clear and expressed terms because the ASEAN Charter demands that you need to be a democracy. You need to comply with the rule of law. Thank you. Thank you, Edmond. Dominique? Uh, just uh, just a quick reaction. Uh, thank you, uh, Sandhya, for the uh, note. I I just uh, checked the CEDAW uh, recommendation, climate change and gender analysis, and I agree that I don't see it reflected well in uh, the issues and or or regulations or legislations of of member states. And I think we we can take note of that. And uh, thank you uh, for uh, Attorney uh, Rico Domingo for for uh, the amazing response. I really respect you. I, I actually follow your work through through the internet, although I'm not a Filipino, <laughs> but it's really interesting to see. Uh, and I think uh, all the young people um, will aspire to be you. And uh, in Amnesty, before I entered the government, <laughs> I was also fighting for uh, the rights, uh, especially the right to remedy. And I think that's one of the um, important um, aspect of human rights itself and I like uh, I connected with what I'm saying uh, previously in my speech uh, one of ASEAN sectoral body uh, actually talks about uh, mutual legal assistance on, cr on criminal matters as well as the right to remedy especially on the law and human rights and I think that can be further discussed on a regional basis thank you attorney thank you okay thank you Dominic uh, sorry we really don't have any more time so, sorry, <laughs> maybe you can do it in private later because uh, we're really way over time. Uh, I apologize, but uh, I just wanted to close it with saying that uh, Minister Kasit mentioned a drastic transformation. The question is how? We haven't been able to answer it yet, uh, but we do need to be confronted by how do we turn around that political will. Um, if there's no will, there's no way. Uh, looking at questioning the status quo, particularly on consensus building, non-interference, and the strong notion of sovereignty. So with that, uh, kindly allow me to thank our panelists for this afternoon. And apologies for overextending such a difficult, <laughs> yeah, it's difficult to, to stop our panelists. Thank you. Thank you. And we are not done yet. <laughs> we have one more exciting session ahead.
Uh, hi, S. S. All right. Um, we come to the last session for today. It's been a long day, I know, but the rest are sure that this last one will be very as, just as entertaining as other sessions. Uh, for the last one, we have a prologue on our human rights journey, Long March to the Full Freedom. It will be uh, done by our very own Professor Emeritus, Vitit Mantaporn, a faculty of Long Chinokon University and former UN Special Rapporteur on various mandates. So, without further ado, Professor Vitit Kap. Swadikap. Good afternoon. It's nearly five o'clock and everybody wants to wake up. So, it's not a prologue. It's a middle log, analog, or an epilogue. <laughs> and you have to help me, please. Number one, quiz. What's the best thing you've done for human rights in one sentence? Can you write it in front of you? Short sentence, please. <clears throat> Short sentence. And maybe we, we feed it into the uh, forum here. Then. No need for names, just ideas. And I'm going to ask for one or two of you to give me your best, your best sentence in two minutes. Very quick, very quick. No paper, my dear. Here we go. Pen. Right there. Very, very quick. No time and um, getting late. Plus, late afternoon, we need to be woken up before your jogging run this evening and dinner. All right. Okay, help me with the epilogue, not a prologue. Yes? You've got one? What's what? No, I've, we've heard enough from you. We want to hear from others. Actually, <laughs> you can write yours in. I'm not, I'm not closing your freedom of speech, but just um, enabling others who've not spoken yet. All right, particularly those who have not spoken. Okay, we're done, and then we'll come to... All right, one, one sample, quickly. Hand up. Those who have not spoken. Yes, give me a sentence. Please, yes, yes, yes. Um, I, I would say exist authentically and allow others to exist authentically. Oh, that's beautiful. Did you hear that? <laughs> Stand up and be heard. Uh, I would say exist authentically and allow others to exist authentically. Very nice. Thank you very much. Another one? Anybody? You know, this is left here, so I should go center and then go right. Okay, young Jen, what's your best sentence on what you've done in your life? The two of you. Uh, or young Jen in the middle here, younger Jen. One sentence. We haven't heard from you, but we have. One sentence, please. Quick. Um. <laughs> Go on, one sentence. One sentence is um, helping migrants amplify their voice. Oh, that's very nice, too. <laughs> that. And then on this side, of course, I'm waiting for the Tantoi's wisdom. You are heard, but of course, sharing with others. I was just about to say coexistence and engagement. Coexistence and engagement. That's very beautiful. Thank you very much. Please write everything in because there's no time. It's quiz one. We have three quizzes. Okay. Now, do you want to hear what my sentence is on human rights? Okay. Yeah. And do you promise that... If you get it wrong, you will do some good exercises to look after yourself after this. But if you get it right, you might come to dinner with me. <laughs> because there's dinner tonight. What do you think I have as my sentence, quickly? 
The best thing I've been done in my life, he writes. Oh, yeah, that's lovely. Thank you very much. Yep, absolutely. Yep. Sorry? Volunteering? Yeah, she's not far. I mean, there's a, it's very near to that one. Thank you very much. That's very nice. Pro bono stuff. Cooperative, corporate job, developing comes into it. Anybody? Left. We've gone right, center, left. Come on, you guys and ladies and girls and boys and gender diverse people. What do you think I have as my sentence to help human rights in my life? What's the best thing I've, I've ever done in a few words? Shanti, I love you for that. Thank you very much. But it's, it's too long. There are too many words. And too many words means human rights illusion. But I love that very much and very, very grateful for that. Just short, short. Speaking up. Well, I, I sometimes speak up, but it's very softly, Emily, sometimes. Uh, yes, anymore? All right, so everybody has to play sports in a good sense. Yoga in the bedroom, all right? Don't have to jog and so on. Sorry, no one's coming to dinner with me tonight. I'm sorry about that. Well, some are coming, but we're talking about the special question. Do you want to know what the sentence is? It's three words. I have prayed prayed said a prayer to do something good that's all and I'm not religious no don't think like that but I think that's me ultimately because that's been the driving force of that journey which leads to pro bono work and all kinds of little things. I still pray a bit. Not religious, but strength of will to give myself a bit of hope and to give it hope. So, the uh, travel today, the journey, is one that's down and up, actually. We've heard a, lot, heard a lot of downs, and we also like to hear some ups, yeah, to boost ourselves in terms of hope, a little bit of constructive optimism here and there, despite everything. So, look after yourselves, please, when you do human rights work. You cannot be frustrated, ultimately. You must, we must journey to give hope. Quiz two. Very quick. I've got two books here. Nothing to do with human rights sex book, but it, I've just been reading them, but I thought I'd share them with you. You know, Vitis Book Club, com com competing with Oprah's book club. But they are something to do with me and you. Because if I was, a few minutes ago, careful about myself in terms of human rights illusion, Speak too much, I speak too much. Cool down, calm down, do something more. What I'd like to do now is have a look at others who look at us. Human rights by allusion. Human rights by allusion, not illusion. How others might look at us. This book won the Booker Prize Global major award last year. And it's called The Seven Moons of Mali Almeida. The Seven Moons of Mali Almeida. It's about civil war in a certain country. And the sentence that shocked me in this book, and this is the down, and then we'll go up, all right? The sentence that shocked me in this book was, Quote, all civilizations begin with genocide. Begin with genocide. That's what it says. 
And it made me reflect and self-reflect on myself. And, and I thought, oh my God. Mm. And the chap, actually, in this book, the person who's speaking is actually a spirit, a soul, going through the seven moons to arrive at the person's finality within a certain cultural perspective. And in the end, despite everything, because he was also doing good, he was taking photos of persons tortured, enforced disappearances, and so on, and then sharing them, I think through some of those good deeds, he was able to drink the water to forget everything and to be reborn. This one just won the Sea Ride Awards, Southeast Asia Writers Award, as is the Thai winner a few months ago. It's called in Thai, and you can't capture this in English, it's a terrible English translation. But I have to read it in Thai because you Thais in giggle, and then we'll translate. Doi rak. Let pu pang. Do it rap. Let pu pang. Now, translated, it says family comes first. But actually, if you translate do it rap, let pu pan, pu pang, it means with love and. Broken, rotten, or destroyed, rotten. That's the literal translation. And the down of this book in 11 short stories is that it's about a Chinese family in Thailand. One of the stories about discrimination against Chinese minority. Quite a few of the stories are about patriarchal society within the minority acting against gender and women's rights. And I'm always wondering why the winners are always so much about suicide and violence and discrimination. Most of the winners are about that. You know, it just stuns me. I mean, if you go, go through five years, winners pass, they, they're usually about killing, death, suicide, and so on. This is Thai literature. And then the final piece, the final chapter is your up. It's about reminiscence of love for mum. It's about reminiscence of love for your good mum. And I guess human rights are a bit like that. I mean, a lot of us work on the desperate side while we shouldn't be too desperate, because it is true there's no remedy tomorrow of everything. But we still project hope along the way. And that's why we're here, to lift our spirits together in solidarity. So that was quiz two, quickly. And what is quiz three? It's not a quiz. It's a journey. We're traveling together. And where does the journey begin? Where is the middle part of the journey? And where is the destination for each and every one of us in all this? We all have our answers. But within the slightly academic discourse, we have a certain structure. The beginnings here are so-called with the four freedoms, as enunciated in 1941, at the beginning of the Second World War, by a certain Mr. Roosevelt, leading to, just after the Second World War, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the middle part, I would say, is about now. The middle part. 
it's sort of transit, it's sort of sojourn. You are enjoying a nice sojourn in Bangkok, maybe. And the final destination part, maybe, maybe, if you really want to look at the chronology of time, will be 2048. Why? Well, structurally, it's 100 years on, isn't it? From the UDHR. So what do you think about 2048? In terms of our projection for the future and what might we be in that existential aspiration of being then and there. So very quickly, very quickly, let's have a look at the beginnings, the origins. Let's look at the sojourn, the middle part, maybe transit in Bangkok. And then what about 2048 plus? Might be beyond, actually, to drink the water or to reminisce with mum. When Mr. Roosevelt uttered those four freedoms, it was a political gesture of a certain kind. But it rang bells. But he was not the inventor of the four freedoms. He wasn't. I mean, the roots, the roots of the freedoms go back to thousands of years in terms of some protection of people. Indian traditions, Artha Sastra, Mahabharata. Over here, you know, 2,000 years ago, there was a certain Emperor Ashoka who brought in Buddhism into this country. And along the way, he issued the Kalinka Edicts, whereby Emperor Ashoka for forbade prohibited killings of civilians, women, children, and fallen soldiers. And so Buddhism crept into this region. And over here, we tend to forget that it's not just Buddhism. I mean, I'm always ask, asking students, what about Islam in the South, the contribution to human rights? And of course, if you look at Islam, there has been a lot of contribution to human rights. Uh, zagat, the rich should contribute to help the poor. And if you read the literature on asylum, um, a lot on protection from the Islamic uh, teachings for asylum seekers and refugees. So, it was not Mr. Roosevelt who invented the right, the freedom from fear, nor from want. But it was just his moment. Fine. And then the message was taken over in this origin by Madame Roosevelt. And in 1948, or two years before, when they were drafting the UDHR, there was a committee of nine members. Four of them are very close to us. i just choose four or five. One, Mrs. Roosevelt, okay? Two, Asian, Asian, who was it? Pen Chun Chang from China. Three, who was it? Lebanon. Charles Malik from Lebanon. Four, I can't forget him because I also teach in France. René Cassin, who was also a Nobel laureate afterwards. And five, there was the secretary of the whole group, John Humphreys. Their inputs went into this draft which was ultimately adopted by many, many countries, what existed then in Paris. And maybe what we should think about is how people also cogitate and reflect and then express their commitments in terms of what they wish to see. So Ellen Roosevelt actually lost her parents in the early days. So she came from a certain orphanhood to care. And she was a very caring person. She also wrote a lot. A lot about caring, social protection, and so on. Cheng, uh, Peng Chun Chan was Chinese. He brought in some Confucian 
ideas. And the words conscience, where it appears in the Universal Declaration, came from that tradition. He also had the patience to say, maybe it's a step-by-step -step thing, so you can't have a convention binding in 1948, but step-by-step -step towards the nine human rights conventions that we see today. Charles Malik brought in the Middle East and touch, and particularly the interaction, interaction between the individual and the family that we still have to deal with. Does collectivity override individual or not? Hopefully not, especially not if it's bad, so to speak. And he was the one who had to bridge the gap between whether to insert the word God in the Declaration. Does the word God appear in the Declaration or not? Hands up those who think God appears in the Declaration. Hands up those who think that God doesn't appear in the Declaration. Hands up those who don't wish to put your hands up. <laughs> it's all right, it's late afternoon. Hands up those who don't wish to think. It's all right, just relax, you know. This is a relaxing quiz. The word God does not appear in the Declaration. The word spirit appears a little bit, but it's a bit wonky. It's a spirit of brotherhood. You know, it's still a bit wonky. So when the Declaration was drafted, you shouldn't just look at what was there or is there, 30 articles, but you should look and see what's not there, thank goodness. Now, let's have a look, three or four, okay? One, God's not there. Well, he may be here, fine, but not in the Declaration because it's more secular. Number two, the word man is not there in Article 1. Thank goodness. Thank goodness. It says every human being. But they had to negotiate to take out man. Right? Yeah, very humbly convergent on that. Thirdly, they had to take out the word citizen. Because if you have the word citizen, discrimination comes in. Human rights are about everyone, irrespective of citizenship. And so on. And there's no reference to right to rebellion either. And it doesn't really cover that well, the notion of war. Even though the US Declaration on the Rights of Man, the, the French Declaration talk about rebellion. But this instrument doesn't talk too much about war, etc. So maybe it's a little gap that you have to deal with. Huh? And we have to creep into another area of international law, humanitarian law, international criminal law, and so on. Yeah? Warfare, which does affect human rights. Okay, so that is the beginnings. And here we are, having a nice adjourn, enjoying tea in Bangkok, transit. We have come to this juncture where you have so many instruments, nine human rights treaties, all the eyes and stuff we're hearing about, all the things we want, we want, we want. Okay? But really, I mean, if it's the four freedoms, what you really have to deal with, as you said already, I mean, freedom of expression, two in exceptions, national security, criminal law, you know, we have 200 kids being prosecuted for emergency decree and les marches day, freedom of religion, well, if you express yourself, you're also limited by national security, but then you've got other issues such as blasphemy, yeah, and the minority among minorities issues you just heard in terms of gender diversity. Want and fear, well, SDGs, but not very well fulfilled, sustainable development goals, and we're still working on them. And fear, well, we've got all the laws that prohibit, but sadly, all the transgressions, right to life, New law against torture in Thailand and enforced disappearances. But look at the spouse of Billy this morning. Still no accountability. So many laws, 
many developing countries love, love laws. They, they remedy by having more laws. But we don't have to believe all that necessarily. And so that is the juncture now in terms of so many standards, so many norms, internationally, nationally. And what is critical is implementation, implementation, implementation with a certain resonance of how to deal with power. It's not just about rights or freedoms. It's about power, how you negotiate, how you build your checks and balances. And that's why you don't have to wait. Don't wait for the UN, please. I come from the UN. I'm often blocked by the UN. And I'm astute enough to have other ways. And I pray also to have the energy to do so. I pray to be of help. I'm not here to be of hate. And please bear in mind that this month, the agenda surrounding the four freedoms was also enlarged by the discussions at the high-level panel to cover three or four areas which are very pertinent today, just in Geneva last week, okay? One, peace and security issues. Wars, Gaza, Ukraine, Myanmar. It is not just human rights, it's the connectivity between human rights and other elements of international law, if you want accountability. What we call law of war, international humanitarian law, international criminal law, etc. It's the whole gamut. You use everything you have without waiting, normatively, as well as what you can do locally, and not just wait for the International Criminal Court or the UN to act. Two, digital technologies. Second key issue just raised by the UN, and it's also raised here. Killer robots, self-automated killing machines, uh, data privacy leaks, uh, hate speech by internet, you know, all the digital uh, technologies. And now we have a study coming up in the UN Human Rights Council. Neurotech, 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 you know, how nano will go into your body or around your body. Yeah, and affect your neural system. Uh, if it's non-invasive, it's a sort of earphone, it is now allowed particularly to help people with disabilities. So you can control your hand through Neurotech, non-invasive. But the crunch is when it's invasive and it's starting to be inserted inside you and it might affect your neural system. And then maybe those who want to aspire to be uber superhumans will want to be but maybe we're all self, also self-destructing. Just two little examples of digital texts you have to be careful with. Thirdly, climate change plus. And we just come from COP28, you know, but it's not just climate change. It's the three, the triple crises. Everybody know, all right? Climate change, pollution, plastic pollution, Loss of biodiversity. Yeah. Prevention is better than cure. And now in COP28, a deal on not just defossilization, but methane. And the business sector is on board for that, together with more um, renewable energy, as, as well as efficient energy, etc. So that's the third one. And the fourth one is development and economy. And actually, it's interesting that the High Commissioner is now talking about human rights economy how to enable economic rights to generate income. Interesting. But anyway, a lot of it's about equity, distribution of income, and so on and so on. And they always forget the fifth. I don't know why the UN always forgets the fifth. They don't like the word democracy. There is no fifth element in that discussion. Well, it's my fifth element. I'd say they needed to discuss democracy and inclusion, but they didn't. And the word democracy seems to be missing a lot from UN documents at this point in time, even though we can't forget that. Democracy at home. Democracy upwards to the UN as well. So that's where we are today. But don't forget that the four freedoms are not just four freedoms. All right, they're tied to rights. 
and you have a context as tested by those four areas the UN's just dealt with this month, added fifth context, democracy by me, as the current flavor, high tea, in Bangkok during your pleasant sojourn and transit. And finally, because time's up in the quiz, where do we go? I mean, what's the destination? What's, what's the arrival point? Where do you want to arrive? Well, I've already, I've already done human rights illusion and then human rights allusion, alluding to literature. Now I want to say, I want to arrive at human rights realization. Because realization is such a nice word. It means two things. Realization means to be aware, perhaps to commit to human rights. But realization also means to implement well, to implement and enjoy human rights. So I want, as my destiny, with my humble little efforts, a bit of a prayer, to get to human rights realization, please. And maybe I would add to uh, Mr. Roosevelt's two freedom, four freedoms, I'd say, I would like to realize the freedom to be human in the face of non-humans, because the bots are coming. And you and I are starting to be rejected by the bots, especially when you fill in your forms incorrectly and everything bounces back. Happens to me all the time. Bot rejection. I want to have access to a human behind it, please. The right to be human and to deal with humans. And um, the other freedom is maybe just freedom to exist with dignity. And in fact, in the reform process of 2005, the freedoms were th that were talked about by Kofi Annan were freedom from want, freedom from fear, and freedom to live in dignity. Sort of summarize everything. So maybe that's the aspiration in terms of freedom to exist with an indignity, meaning everything. But why? Because, dear friends, the world in 25 years on will be difficult. It will be a world of precarity. We've not had the last pandemic. We've not had the last war. And yet we must work with that hope to show that there is the aspiration to be, to live, to partner. And if you have to draft in 2048 a new Universal Declaration of Human Rights, of human rights what would it look like? Anybody? Very easy. Google Universal Declaration of Human Rights 2048. It just pops up. It's done for you. Homework is done for you. And it puts in red the additions that the drafter wants to see. And some, some words are quite good, actually. Uh, the first sentence that they've added for UDHR 2048 is the word solidarity. It's a good word. The drafter wants the word solidarity there. So that's a nice word. I would say as a second word in terms of aspiration for the future, also posterity is a good one. I mean, we are concerned with intergenerational, and we're very happy to hear from young people here. And uh, under the Secretary General's Common Agenda 2021, together with the Summit for the Future next year, there'll be much more emphasis on youth. We now have a youth ambassador and we're due to have a youth town hall attached to the UN. But, in fact, that's still not enough because I want, I, want a, I want a people's town hall attached to the UN, actually. But let's start with youth. It's fine. And we have a, a global youth envoy at this moment. But according to one country, youth is under 48. Huh? But, but under UN, it's usually under 25. All right, so let's get the real rep there. Okay. <laughs> not co-opted either. All right, so posterity. Third one is intersectionality. Many types of intersectionality. We've heard about gender already. 
but I would say status, situation, and others creep in. Definitely the link between peace, human rights, democracy, sustainable development, environmental protection. Definitely. That connectivity cannot be forgotten, even if from UN literature the word democracy seems to be creeping out rather than creeping in. And then finally, two others maybe, just to round off with, at the end of the day, after intersectionality. Actionability. In this draft of 2048, it talks a lot about criminal action against the culprits, you know. So that's one way of being actionable, taking action in the International Criminal Court, in the local courts. But I would use the word actionable in a different sense. I just want it to be sort of action from us in terms of being an example of what we can do very humbly, even mentally or within the spirit. You don't have to wait for International Criminal Court or the court system. You can do something within yourself as action to activate yourself to be kind and caring and helpful, with or without a prayer. So actionability is both systemic for me as well as extremely personal. And then finally, one word I like very much is empathy. Empathy. Through education, through socialization. Today, we have a wonderful day together, which nurtures a sense of empathy together. And last but not least, when we travel together from the beginnings to the sojourn and towards the next step, I don't know, 2048, or you want to go to eternity, your pick, my pick, I would say that Whatever you choose as the destination, we should ask ourselves, what is our sense of arrival? What do we see as arrival? If the vision is a physical arrival, the tangibility of physicality, of all the good things, you know, peace, human rights, maybe a bit difficult, it goes up and down, you know, like bit this. But maybe I am humbly, even more humble than that. Maybe I'm not even projecting the physical tangibility of everything, you know, under the sun, human rights, democracy, etc. Maybe I would say, what about some spiritual, not religious, some spiritual contentment in what we do and in knowing that it is the preferred way. And maybe with that, we can also find a certain sense of arrival within ourselves and not be too frustrated, but to be part of the trajectory of hope. To be part of that serenity to project hope it is part of arrival with serendipity. Serendip, the pleasure of arrival. So, serendip, serendipity. Very humbly, small, together, here, there, and everywhere. Serenity, serendipity of the spirit and the mind. Breathe in, breathe out. Inhale, exhale. With good wishes for yourself and with good wishes for others. That is the point of arrival. Mm. Undulating. Up and down, pulsating, with the cascades, the cataract, the cascades of time. Thank you very much. I'm sure everybody is already awake. <laughs> All right. Um, so. Uh, Thank you very much, Professor Vitit, for your ever 
always enlightening spe enlightening speech. Uh, well, on behalf of the Faculty of Law, uh, I would like to also, to also thank the co-organizers and also the audiences for your contributions today. And as Professor Wittig said, you know, with realization, we have. I think we are now aware of the four freedoms enshrined in the UDHR, and also we are implementing uh, the, 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 the principles. So basically, it's do what you can and in your capability, and I'm, I am sure that the Faculty of Law at University today has already done just that, and I hope that we can do more and you will do it too. Um, but before we close, uh, we have a final remarks from Dr. Sipapa Petmisi, who will be giving the final notes. Thank you. Thank you, Khaijan Pawat. Uh, it would not be a final note, but it would be a note of thanks. And I would like to do it again. Um, of course, I would like to thank all speakers and survivors of this long day seminar. <laughs> I call survivors because it has been quite a long day. And you survive. Especially, I think you revive, revitalized by the last speaker, Professor Vithit Mantarpon. Uh, he actually uh, woke us up with many questions and with many quiz. So thank you very much indeed. I uh, would also like to thank uh, in fact, I will have to say that uh, the Faculty of Law, since last June, uh, we have been organizing a series of seminars on 25 years of UDHR. But then, yeah, when um, we met, you know, there was a meeting in Jakarta that I met um, our friends from the working group of an Asian Humorous Mechanism, especially Malaysian working group that I forgot to thank this morning, because they already they put, uh, actually have some initiative to organize um, an event with a, a rather similar idea. So we were saying that why don't we actually partner uh, to organize this event together in Bangkok uh, in December. We could not do it earlier. Uh, due, due to some particular problems. But I, I really like to record our thank, uh, not only on, on behalf of Faculty of Law, Chilalongkorn University, but also on behalf of the working group for an ASEAN Human Rights Mechanism for the initiative made by Malaysian Working Group. Uh, I could not, uh, not to mention a few names here. Uh, I would like to first of all mention the name of Uma, Uma Wati, who actually, who actually, you know, uh, organized uh, almost everything. Uh, I would like to thank Anne Sansani, has been always you know, there to help us. She is there, yeah. And I would like, the whole, would like to thank the whole team working behind the scene. Uh, you know, making sure that everything goes well here at Faculty of Law, Yulalongkorn University. Uh, I think some of you might have uh, communicate, might have been communicating with uh, Wani or Yui, uh, who has been, you know, working on this uh, particular uh, event as well. And of course, I would like to uh, thank, to mention uh, Dr. Pawat, who has been always there supporting, you know, initiatives. Uh, that uh, at, that uh, as soon as uh, actually as soon as I came to Faculty of Law, Jilalongkorn University, I feel that I have been adding a lot of works on them, <laughs> and sorry for that. Um, I cannot also forget to thank our two interpreters. They have been really instrumental. Um, they have been sitting in that small box since this morning, and I could you know, fully understand how, you know, because with little space, you can really, you cannot really breathe. And I think this is, this is more or less the same as human rights. We need space to talk about human rights. We need space to do human rights work. So them, for two of them sitting there, with a lot of work to do without much space is really, you know, 
unbearable, but they have been bearing with this until now. Thank you very much in this, um, uh, for this. And I uh, would like to also, I think uh, my thanks, you have to go again to FNF for sponsoring this, uh, this event. Uh, without sponsor from FNF, added by ne uh, Norwegian Human Rights Center at Oslo University, many of us would not have been here. Uh, so thank you very much indeed. I think with that, we can end this long day seminar. <laughs> it, it's, it's, it was not supposed to be as long as this one. It was supposed to end at about uh, a quarter past four, or at best half past four. But I think it's now 26 past five, and it's time to end. So thank you, you all very much again for joining us. <laughs>